Joe Ruth in rookie season of 49 home runs. Oakland's Mark McGuire ignited huge expectations, and he satisfied those for three seasons until last year when the thump mysteriously disappeared. Now a new off-season fitness program has the whack back, and the comparisons to Maris and the Babe are flourishing again. Massachusetts as ESPN's Friday Night Baseball brings you the Oakland Athletics and the Boston Red Sox. A pleasant good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Meese along with Jerry Royce. And Jerry, we think of a hitter's haven when we think of Fenway, but only 12 homers have been hit here all season. However, there's a guy in the visiting dugout tonight that has five more homers than that all by himself. And you're talking about Mark McGuire. At the end of last season, McGuire looked into the mirror and didn't like what he saw. Took care of some personal problems, going on a weightlifting program, and look at the results. 17 home runs, 36 RBIs, and it leads the league in both categories. Now, what about the Boston Red Sox? This is a team that in the past has hit a lot of home runs, but they have only 14 as a team this season. They only have five here at home at Fenway Park. What's up with these guys? The only thing that can explain it is the weather. It's been cold, it's been damp, and the wind's been blowing in. Let's take a look at the standings. First of all, in the American League East, where you see the Red Sox, off uh, the uh, uh, strings of a three-game winning streak are right in the middle of the race, four games behind the Toronto Blue Jays, even though they're not hitting as a team. Meanwhile, in the West, the Oakland A's have established a game-and-a-half lead, coming off a three-game sweep of the Orioles at the brand-new Camden Yards. Pitching, though, is the reason that the Boston Red Sox are in the race in the American League East. Well, Roger Clemens and then Viola. The joke around here is that it's Clemens and Viola, and... Clemens and Viola. Uh -huh. But Viola has something to prove. Two of the last three seasons, he's been underneath 500. But look at how well they've anchored this Red Sox staff. You put the starters together and relievers together, and what do you have? The Red Sox are on top. They have the top ERA, and you see there the A's ranked 10th as a, as a staff, and part of their staff, of course, is Dave Stewart, who used to be unbeatable a couple of years ago, not so recently. After four 20-game seasons, Dave Stewart dropped off a bit, 11-11 with an earned run average of above five, and he's continued somewhat on that pace this year, 2-4 and four with an earned run average above four. Dave has something to prove. He wants to let everybody know that Stu is back. Another near sellout crowd here at Fenway Park on a gorgeous evening for baseball. Let's take a look at the lineup. The Tony Larusa's Oakland A's will throw at lefty Frank Viola and the Boston Red Sox. Leading off, maybe the best leadoff hitter ever. Ricky Henderson will play left field. Batting second, the third baseman, Carney Lansford. Designated hitter tonight, Jose Canseco. The cleanup spot, Mark McGuire and his 17 home runs. Batting fifth will be catcher Terry Steinbach. Followed by the center fielder, 18-year veteran Willie Wilson. Scott Brocious will get a rare start tonight. He'll be playing right field. Mike Bordick may be the story of this team at shortstop. More on that later. And batting ninth playing second base will be Lance Blankenship. And there is big lefty Frank Viola. Jerry? Frank Viola, first year with the Red Sox. Has won four out of five starts here in, in, in Fenway Park and has done so well here in his career. One of the reasons why the Red Sox have signed him. And Ricky Henderson, there you see his stats. His average is a bit lower than what we're, we're accustomed to seeing because of the excellence he has displayed over the years. Of course, to go with that, 19 stolen bases to go with a 266 average, 17 RBIs, five doubles, and six home runs for Ricky Henderson. There's the, the dimension that really sets him apart from other leadoff hitters, Jerry, his consistent power at the plate to start off an inning. And 50, a ball game. Yeah, 51 times he's hit that home run. Well, no home run, but the A's will take it. A ground single underway Boggs, and just like that, Ricky Henderson is on with a leadoff single. Defense behind Frank Viola tonight. Greenwell, Burks, and Plantier in the outfield. Boggs, Rivera, Reed, and Cooper in the infield. Tony Pena doing the catching. So Henderson is on first with a ground single to left, and that'll bring up the third baseman, Carney Lansford. And, of course, the by play here is the game between Frank Viola and Ricky Henderson. An interesting one indeed. That it is. Lifetime, Henderson has stole four bases off Viola. Lansford, meanwhile, swinging at the first pitch, hits it into the gap in right center field. Back there making the catch. 
is Phil Prams here on the run near the track. And one gone. Henderson retreats to first. Vi Viola works fast, and the A's are hitting early in the count against Frank Viola. Word out on Frank is that he throws strikes. And if you're going to get him, let's go right after him and do it early. Well, the booze you hear must mean that Jose Cansenko must be in the park somewhere. A sign of respect for number 33. Canseco, 221 average, that's down. Home runs, he had six in his first dozen ball games or so, only two since then. Two doubles, 25 RBIs for Jose, who's had a string of injuries, Jerry. The last one, a bruised knee last Sunday at Yankee Stadium. And tonight, starting as a DH instead of Harold Baines, who's had his problems against left-handed hitters, or left-handed pitchers. Canseco with that open stance. One of his trademarks, and he strides into the pitch. Canseco hits Viola well. 375 career hitter against Frank Viola. He's having a bit of a problem with his shoulder as well. He says of his right shoulder, he doesn't have the strength he used to, and he says he just can't hit the fastball the way he's been used to hitting it. He, he had those six home runs early in his first dozen ball games, only two since then, though. It's hard to get adjusted to the fact that you're a Superman for most of your career when you swing the bat, and now you're a mere mortal because you have a bit of an injury. But he's got bat speed that still is something to behold when you get around the batting gauge before the game. Here's the 1-0. Nope. I was going to say the 1-0 pitch to Canseco, but you can't assume that with Ricky Henderson at first. Nor with Frankie Viola on the mound because he likes to throw over there, and he's successful at holding the runner on base. Ricky, of course, the all-time leader in Major League Baseball, stolen bases, 19 so far this season. Not going, and Kanchenko swings and misses for strike one. Henderson leading off the game with a ground single to left. And a deep fly to right by Lansford. One on and one gone for the A's here, top of the first. Henderson not going out of the strike zone two and one the count to Canseco take a look at it Frankie Viola in depth our pitching profile he's strong early he only gave up five first inning runs and in 35 starts last year 103 earned run average this year he's only given up one earned run in eight of his first inning starts holds base runners close we're seeing a pretty good job of that they were only successful in six of 22 attempts as Canseco fouls that pitch back. He also has a good pickoff move with six of them. A Steelers this year, one for four. And he's durable. The only pitcher to hurl 200-plus innings in a year since 1983. Frank Viola, his problem the last few years has been after the All-Star break, Jerry. He got off to a great start with the Mets last year and fell apart after the break. Part of it had to do with a cyst that was under his finger, his middle finger. And he couldn't grip the ball properly, especially that great changeup that he has. Two balls, two strikes to the count to Canseco. Henderson takes his lead, not going, and Jose fouls one off. Now the first baseline into the crowd. That remains at two and two. Let's take a look at Canseco, the big man getting the bat into the ball. Don't you think pitchers know about it when somebody's hurting? Look at Canseco. He leads with that back shoulder and drags the bat through the zone. You don't see that all too often. And Senko's had a variety of injuries, but he's a gamer. The last four out of the last six years, he's played in 150 or more games. Swing and a miss. Henderson has to dive back into first base is Tony Pena, who has a gun behind the plate. Thought he had Ricky leaning the wrong way. Two gone. You got to be aware when Pena is the man behind the plate. Just ask Mr. Henderson. One great thing about doing a ball game in Fenway Park is you get such great camera angles, and this really isolates. First of all, the swing and a miss by Canseco and a pitch out of the strike zone. Then that snap throw by Tony Pena. Had it been on the infield side of the bag, he'd had a close play at first base. Now all the hot dog vendors stand still. The people rush back from the restrooms, take their seats because Mark McGuire has been introduced at Fenway Park. His stance, legendary in the early part of the season. 17 home runs, 36 RBIs. Six ahead of the second place man in home runs, Rob Deere in the American League. 
and the media onslaught has begun. Everywhere he goes now, people talk to him about this great start. The thing they're comparing him to now is how he's doing in May, April mm -hmm. and May. Will he tie the Mickey Mantle home run record of 20? There you see it. No sooner we talk about it than <laughs> we have it right there for you in a graphic. Triple crown year, 1956 for the Mick. You know, it really boggles the mind. If he keeps this up, and I'm not saying that he will, a lot of guys have gotten off to fast starts and, and faded by comparison because Ruth and Maris came on late in those seasons with the 60 and 61 homers. But if he keeps this up, the media crush on him is going to be unbelievable. Up the box, over the head of Viola, Jody Reed has the play at second, and the Red Sox are out of the inning. On the fourth, no runs, a hit, no errors, and one left. After one half inning, Oakland nothing, Boston coming to bat. Boston, a beautiful evening. Let's take a look at the starting lineup for the Boston Red Sox that'll face Oakland's Dave Stewart tonight. Leading off at second base, a hot bat of late, Jody Reed. Mike Greenwell back in the Red Sox lineup. He'll be playing left, hitting second. Wade Boggs, Mr. Dependable at third, will hit third. The designated hitter, as always, Jack Clark hit fourth. Bill Plantier, really been struggling at the plate. He'll hit fifth. Ellis Perks in the hole he likes a lot, the number six hole, the center fielder. Batting seventh, playing first base. will be Scott Cooper, the shortstop, Luis Rivera, and the catcher hitting ninth, Tony Pena. And the pitcher for the Oakland A's, Stu, Dave Stewart. Cool Stu, as we used to call him back in Los Angeles. 12 and 5 lifetime against the Red Sox with an earned average of 4 plus and in that's in 21 regular season appearances. However, Stude has run a little bit of a problem as of late in his last four starts covering 26 and the third innings. He's walked 20 batters. Seven of them have come around to score. The defense behind Cool Stew tonight Henderson, Wilson, and Brocious in the outfield. Lansford, Bordick, Blankenship, McGuire in the infield. Terry Steinbach doing the catching. Cool Stu. I'll have to relay that I'm sure, to him. I'm sure he hasn't heard that in, in several years. Cool is not the word for the weather tonight, and that in itself is new here in Boston. For the first month of the season, the average temperature was 40 degrees at game time. Here tonight, in May, the latter part thereof, 86 degrees, no rain in sight, humidity low. You could not order a better night for baseball in the hub of New England, Boston. There's an area not too far away from here that today recorded a record low in the morning and a record high in the evening. Or this happened yesterday. Can you believe that? Yes, I've lived in New England 13 years. There's a saying, Jerry, if you don't like New England weather, wait 30 minutes, it'll change. <laughs> That's about it. Jody Reed hits the first pitch of the game, a pop-up right down the first baseline, and Steinbach puts it away. One pitch and one gone here in the bottom of the first. Let's take a look at the profile of Dave Stewart. Just as we said that Frank Viola was strong early, Dave Stewart is vulnerable early. Last year, 27 first inning runs and in 35 starts. Problems again this year. Four first inning runs in nine starts. And he's had his control problems. He's walked close to five batters per nine innings this year. But the control doesn't have to do with just missing pitches. It has to do with pitches around the plate. And you can see how that looks as far as walks and the number of home runs he's given up. Eight home runs he's given up so far. Plus, he's the second winningest pitcher since 1987 in all of major leagues. Mike Greenwell, the left fielder, comes up hitting 213, playing in only his 22nd game of the season, but quickly he's behind. No balls, two strikes to Stewart. You mentioned the walks. Yes, Dave Stewart does have 44 strikeouts, but also he's given away 35 free passes this season. That ratio is not good. Well, seven of those la last 20 men he's walked have come around to score. And when you take a look at the batting average against him, which has gone down 225 against him, and he has those walks, you understand right now why his earned run average is four and a quarter. Greenwell in left tonight, activated last Sunday off the disabled list, batted in the number two spot the last three games, first time in his career, so it's four in a row for Greenwell in the number two hole. No home runs for Mike on the season, six RBIs, and those are un-Greenwell like numbers. Two and two of the count to him. Cold weather and an injury will certainly do that to you. One of you can't mm. seem to get into any kind of a groove. Coming off a strained right wrist, that was the designation. Is now he hangs around and draw a full count from Stewart. This was another problem last year. Dave Stewart getting his pitch count up, running a lot of full counts. Missing in the strike zone, falling behind hitters. It guarantees you that you're going to have a disappointing season. What really saved Stewart last year was the fact that the A's scored over five runs a game for him. That helps, too, when a guy goes fishing and a pitch down around his ankles. Greenwell swings and misses. Two gone for the Red Sox. Now, let's quickly go to Gary Miller. 
Tom, we take you to the Olympic Stadium for Philippe Ballou's debut. They got Grissom aboard, Delano De Shields against Tom Glavin, looking for extra bases. Denied! Dave Justice with a sliding grab as the Braves try to thwart a rally. Back to you. Hi, right, Gary. Philippe Ballou. Many, many years. Great player in the major leagues. His son, Moises Ballou, plays for that Montreal team. Now, Dad is managing. 38 games into the season, Montreal. They usually fire the hockey coach up there before the baseball manager. Here's the one ball, no strike pitch to Wade Boggs, and Stewart behind Wade, two and nothing. Boggs's average is well below what we're accustomed to seeing, 273, but of late. He has started to raise it. His bat has gotten hot, and he's hitting 340 lifetime against Dave Stewart. Last 10 games, Boggs has raised his average to 371 during that 10 game span. Goes the other way down the left field line. This ball is out of here. Home run, Boggs. I think he's surprised. Make no mistake about it, he's surprised. He's going around first base with his head down. And then he heard the roar of the crowd, looked up, and saw Henderson looking into the net. Yes, he was surprised that he had a home run, his first one of the season. That ball had retro rockets on it. I, I thought it was going to come off about the midway point up the Green Monster if it stayed fair. Not only did it stay fair, it got a little boost, and it's in the net. I wonder how much help that little bit of a wind that's blowing out the left field had with that ball. Maybe just enough to turn a double into a home run and the Boston lead. That'll bring up the designated hitter, Jack Clark. Gets under it and fouls it off. Let's take another look at that Ruthian blast by Wade Boggs. Boggs does what he does so well. Waits for a pitch in the strike zone that he can handle. Sees the ball come off the bat. He knows he has a pretty good chance of that ball being fair. What surprised him, though, is the fact that it went over. Just barely went over. Scrapes the paint on the back of the, of the Green Monster. Great camera work there down the left field line showing you a view you don't often get. How close. If that thing hits about three inches lower, it's off the wall for maybe a single, probably a double. It's a double. Boggs was thinking double from when he <laughs> left home plate. He knows this wall and knows it well. So a solo shot by Wade Boggs, who does have some power. He, he's maligned in two areas, in his defense and his power. But his power, though, usually is in the alleys. Clark, the ball in the dirt, one and two. I asked Wade before the game, how come you guys aren't hitting home runs? He said, well, it's the weather, that's all. Apparently, he's a prophet. 86 degrees, there you go. Either that or you ate the right kind of chicken today. Being superstitious, he hits his first home run of the year. Does that mean he's going to talk to you before every ball game now? From it's obvious. Now? That's obviously the key, Jerry. And um, <laughs> next time I'm going to do a half-hour profile on the life and times of Wade Boggs, and he will not refuse. <laughs> what did you talk about? You changed it around for him. <laughs> and I, I talked about his stolen bases and uh, how last night he equaled, or two nights ago he equaled his total of last year. One. <laughs> Jack Clark, meanwhile. Trying to up his average. He's hitting below the Mendoza line, 196, and looks at one inside for ball three. Another full count to Clark. Last two starts for Jack the Ripper, two for five, including two home runs. They were both mighty blasts against the Royals in Kansas City. And on deck, Bill Plantier has also had his problem swinging the bat. Clark, a high fly ball to shallow center. Going back is the second baseman, Blankenship. And he calls everybody off and makes the catch. So the solo home run by Wade Boggs has played in the only run of the game. After one, it's Fenway. It's Boston one and Oakland nothing. Second inning here at Fenway Park. And Minnesota's hollow right. They're only two and a half behind these Oakland A's in the American League West. Coming into play tonight, Tom Mees and Jerry Royce with you. Terry Steinbach. The catcher for the Oakland Athletics uh, leads it off 231 average for Terry one homer four RBIs and four doubles on the season. Real steadying influence for Tony La Russa behind the plate. Takes one outside and low for Viola ball one. What a contrast the temperature is from last week. Mm. 
Last week when it was here, when you were here, it was what? 40 some degrees? 40 some degrees and Roger Clemens pitching. It was cold. Come out here and it's a summer's day all within the course of a week. This is baseball weather. At a real baseball park. Do I smell the commentary, Jerry? <laughs> Steinbach takes a called strike two, one and two from Viola. Now you see, Frank, you know, the, the one stat there, four and one at Fenway. He's making his ninth start seventh here at home at Fenway Park. That's that's pretty good if you can arrange that. Have 77 out of nine starts come at your home park. Unless it's Wrigley Field, then you're in trouble. Down goes Steinbach, first down of the inning, second strike out for Viola. The reason why I said that it's a real ballpark, it's one of those rare ballparks that you walk into, you can sense the history, you can smell the stale beer, the peanuts, the hot dogs, and if you close your eyes, you can almost get a sense that there's Babe Ruth here and Williams played here. All the greats of the American League have walked onto this field. Jerry Royce pitched here one time. One time. Yeah. And I bet you never forget it. <laughs> what happened? No decision. No decision. Well, Maybe you will forget it. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Willie Wilson, who just keeps going and going and going like that bunny you see on TV all the time, takes a called strike. Wilson, 4 of 19 on his road trip, couple of walks, and with the injury to Dave Henderson, Wilson's been the starting center fielder for 30 out of the 40 games played by the A's so far this year. Seems like I've been seeing Willie since I was a kid. Bouncer to shortstop. Gobble up there by Luis Rivera. And two gone. Now Frank Viola, a real workhorse. You doubt that? Look at the innings in the last 10 years. With some of the real workhorses in baseball. Jack Moore is the only one ahead of Frankie V. We said in the pitching profile, that Frankie V is very durable and it shows right there but look at number eight Dave Stewart out of nowhere since 1983 throwing almost but he'll get 2,000 innings this year for sure and Charlie up there with over 2,100 uh, innings the last 10 years what you didn't see is how many pass balls have uh, been issued that's coming up yes. <laughs> how many catchers have gone into therapy after trying to catch that thing Scott Roach is the right fielder Usually you see Jose Canseco out there and right. Canseco with his myriad of injuries is the DH. Brocious under the glove of Bog. The Rivera gobbles it up. Makes the throw. Brocious just beats it out. Good play there by Rivera. Really nothing he could do about getting his man, but an excellent effort by the shortstop for Boston. Wade Boggs has tremendous range at third base. This is not a hard hit ball. Boggs gets, gets a good jump on it, but it just gets past him. But Rivera is there to snag it. Makes an off-balance throw, the long throw to first base. Cooper does everything he can to try to turn it into an out. Not good enough, says Mark Johnson. Brocious beat it. Brocious only his fifth game since coming out the disabled list. Is on with his second hit since coming back. And here's a real story. Yes, don't adjust your sets, friends. Shortstop Mike Bordick from Old Town, Maine, is second in the American League batting race at 351. He's opened up his stance a bit from last year. That is, he has his left leg, which is his front leg, open just a bit toward third base. Says that now he can see the ball with both eyes. And when you can do that, I guess if you can see with two eyes, it doubles your, your vision. Rocious at first, and Bordick fouls it back. Now, Bordick being from New England, being a Mena, as they say, played at the University of Maine under legendary coach John Winkin. He's got a lot of family and friends here at, at Fenway Park. A lot of them. I'd hate to be the A's traveling secretary trying to fill that order. He's the first player from the state of Maine playing regularly in the major leagues in some 50 years. Rivera has it, should get his man at second. Close play, but Brocious is out, and so are the A's here in the second. No runs, a hit, no errors, and one left. After one and one half innings from Fenway, Red Sox won, and the A's nothing. Red Sox in the second. Two years ago, he won 22 games. Last year, 11. We asked his catcher, what's up? When Stu was going good for those four years, if I called an inside fastball, he gave me an inside fastball. We called the fastball away. He executed the fastball away. Now we're running into a problem where 
uh, his fastballs are catching a little bit too much of the plate. Uh, some of his fork balls are hanging a little bit instead of uh, 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 being down in the strike zone. And again, the uh, the problem that Stu runs into is that with his reputation, the hitters are extremely ready. We we play some of the uh, uh, younger teams, the teams with younger personnel. They can't wait to get a hit off Dave Stewart. So if he makes one mistake, boom, they jump on him. And he faces Phil Plantier to open the second inning. No balls and one strike, Jerry. I have to agree with everything that he said. And it, it's something that's really no secret throughout the league. Stu is getting his pitches up in the strike zone. He's been wild, but he's been wild in the strike zone. Meanwhile, Phil Plantier is really having his problems this season. He's behind 0-2 to Stewart. Looks at one high and outside for ball one. Had major surgery in the offseason, did Plantier, and his right elbow and what was characterized as just plain surgery later was called major surgery after it was learned that doctors had to reroute the ulnar nerve which is the big nerve through the elbow the latter part of last year he played 53 games and plantier hit 331 so far this season he's hitting at a 208 clip 2 2 delivery is outside another full count by stewart to start the second all he needs to do is reroute those line drives now. <laughs> Tony La Russa on the Oakland bench. Most of the time, pretty affable guy. Does have a temper, though, as he displayed at Yankee Stadium last weekend when he got into it with Buck Showalter, literally. When he loses it, they say it is legendary. Three balls and two strikes to plant here. Stays alive. On the other hand, you have the rookie manager, Butch Hampson, who managed the Paw Sox in Pawtucket, Rhode Island last year. Played for several years the Red Rooster here in Boston. Actually, that's the wrong moniker. The Rooster was Rick Burleson, but Hampson did play for several years here in Beantown. Plant here hangs tough at three and two. Eight pitches he's seen from Dave Stewart. After eight pitches, you get a pretty good idea of the velocity. You've seen the way the ball moves if it's moving good tonight. Stewart has already run three full counts, and we're not out of the second inning. Pops him up. Will it stay fair? Lansford drifting into foul Play territory on the cinders and makes the play. And that was not nearly as easy as it looked. There's never such a thing as a routine pop-up in Fenway Park with the breeze, with the proximity of the stands, the way it is. It's close, very close down the left field line. You have to know how to play here. Lansford does because he spent a lot of time here for the Red Sox. Look at how close it is. You have to have a lot of communication with your dugout exactly where you are. You'll also see the shortstop go back into short left field and a ball hit off that wall. Defenses are worked out pre-game unlike it is anywhere else in any other major league ballpark. Ellis Birch takes a called strike. Let's take a look at what you were talking about, Jerry. Gordick letting him know. You're okay. You're all right. Guys on the bench, you're saying it's okay. The fans, they let you know. Do anything they can to keep that hitter alive. They're boss Sox. <laughs> yeah, they tell Lansford, back up. The fence is going to get you. Ellis Birch might get Dave Stewart the way he's been swinging the bat. It's no balls and two strikes to Birch, but... He has uh, eight extra base hits, four home runs, and 14 RBIs in his last 18 games. The month of May has been good to Ellis Burks, and just a couple of nights ago, a grand slam home run, the sixth of his career, to win a game for Roger Clemens and the Sox against Seattle. He's in a hole against Stewart, 0-2. Both Plantier and Burks have taken some pretty good rips off of Dave Stewart fastball. It's almost as if here it comes, see what you can do with it. So he has a lot of movement on those pitches because they are following him back and just staying alive. Since Burks has been moved to the number six hitting position, which he's in in this game, he's hit 500, five out of 10 since being moved to the six hole in the lineup. High for a ball, two and two the count. For a lot, long time there, Burks was the Sox cleanup hitter. And he said, they told me before the game, listen, I told Butch Hobson, I'm just not comfortable being a cleanup hitter. He puts too much pressure on himself. He feels a lot less pressure hitting six. And it's really paid off. Meanwhile, 
Stewart was up on him two strikes. It's now two and two. Burks fouls it off, and it will be out of play behind the A's dugout. Stewart constantly throwing in the 90, 91 mile an hour range. That's pretty good for a fastball pitcher. Yeah, he can still he can still bring it with the best of them. Problem is, last year, and from what I can see tonight, his pitch count is going to tell a toll. He keeps running these full counts. Dave Stewart with a no wind up delivery this year. There was talk about in spring training the possibility of American League hitters picking up his pitches from his windup, so he altered his windup so as to keep that pitch a secret until he actually released it. Called strike three in the outside corner, and Birch knew it. Great pitch there by Stewart. Two gone here for the Sox here in the second. That'll bring up the first baseman, Scott Cooper. Stewart's established a pattern in early in this ballgame. So he gets ahead of the hitters, and he tries to go for strike three. Just can't seem to get the uh, third strike past the guy until that particular pitch. Coming up next from Candlestick, Billy Swift and the Giants. Swift in his 6-0 record taking on the New York Mets, who split a four-game set in San Diego. And Bobby Bonilla looked at an old baseball card. This is not a joke. When he was with Pittsburgh, and his, he took a look at his swing and, and knew immediately what he was doing wrong. Since he looked at that baseball card, he's hit a couple of home runs and a few extra base hits in there as well. It's true. I couldn't make that up. You don't miss a thing, do you? No, I tell you. You guys who work at Sports Center get everything. <laughs> everything comes across your desk. Well, it's called osmosis, Jerry. I mean, <laughs> enough stuff goes across in front of your eyes, you got to absorb some of it. Here's the 1 1. I'll tell you, it's a good thing I listened to Sports Center tonight. I, I've been on the road all day. I honestly didn't hear that Tom Runnels had been fired at Montreal. We get into the pregame uh, meal here at the press box, and they asked me who replaced him. And I looked around for you to see if you were there. <laughs> and Sports Center gave us all the details. Stewart's behind on the batter. Cooper, three and one. Cooper's last start at first, May 18th. That's last Saturday against Seattle. Went one for three in that ball game. It's really since Carlos Quintana went down, first base by committee here, Jerry. We've seen Scott Cooper, Tom Brunanski, and even Jack Clark. I saw him taking ground balls at first tonight. Another full count. And this one and gets away for ball four. Four full counts and counting here in the ball game for Stewart, and we're not out of the second. He's still getting the ball up there, pretty good velocity, but what'll happen, you get to the sixth or seventh inning, you've thrown over 100 pitches, maybe getting close to 120, something's going to suffer just a little bit. Those pitches that had some good velocity, some good movement, they're going to slow down just a bit and have a little less movement. The hit hitters will catch up with it. Luis Rivera, the shortstop, six RBIs, no home runs on the season, has an eight-game hitting streak. Cooper takes his lead. Rivera looks at ball one. Rivera's been bothered by a sore right hit, and he had to leave the game on the 16th of May and missed the last Sunday's game. But he is hitting 333 with men on base. There you see Cooper taking his lead. Two and all to count to Rivera. That pit count concern you at all? 38 pitches, not out of the second? Doesn't concern me. I just wonder if it concerns <laughs> Dave Duncan, the pitching coach for Oakland. Stewart consistently has taken the A's into the seventh inning this year. He averages about six and two-thirds inning per start. His record, though, two and four coming into this evening. Lansford in a bit at third. It'll pay off because he'll get the man at first base, picks up the grounder by Rivera, and the A's are out of the inning. No runs, no hits, no errors, and one left. After two from Fenway, still one nothing Boston. Miller Genuine Draft brings you this day in baseball. Nine years ago on May 22nd, Cliff Johnson of the Blue Jays hit his 18th career pinch hit home run. That tied Jerry Lynch's Major League record. Keith Cliff, where are you now? Back to Fenway. Thanks, Gary. Another question. Jerry Lynch, where are you now? There's a guy who could really put a, a powder on a baseball if he ever made contact. Jerry Lynch. 
Hopefully the both of them are at home watching ESPN tonight and they'll write in and let you know. Yeah. Top of the third inning, one nothing Boston. Tom Mees and Jerry Royce with you from Fenway Park. Glad you could be with us on this gorgeous Friday night. 86 degrees at game time. Lance Blankenship hitting ninth in the A's order leads it off in the third against Frank Viola. No runs, two hits for Oakland. One run, one hit. The Wade Boggs home run for the Red Sox. And quickly, Viola is behind Blankenship, 2-0. Blankenship has had some miseries of his own. He missed a couple of games earlier this week with a strained abdominal muscle. First uh, couple of games he's missed this season. Just 3 of 17 on this current road trip for Blankenship, who lost one down the right field line foul. Two and one. And a beautiful New England sunset on this May 22nd. After a very cold and rainy April, they're starting to talk about droughts in New England all of a sudden here in the month of May. Another foul, two and two. Blankenship testing the old lumber. Blankenship at second base. Two balls, two strikes, and the dirt full count for Viola. Seen a lot of full counts by both pitchers in this game, haven't we? Sure have. Four so far by Dave Stewart in two innings. And I believe this is the second by Frank Viola. Ricky Anderson hopes that Blankenship can get on. Henderson has the A's only hit of the evening, a leadoff single to the left. And there goes Blankenship, the first. With a leadoff walk. Let's go to Gary Miller. Tom, here's how the Red Sox arch rivals are doing. Dante Bichette at homer in the top of the second, but then an answer by Kevin Moss off Jamie Navarro. A two-run blast, his fifth of the year, and the Yanks take back the lead two to one as the Brewers come to bat in the third. Back to you, Tom. All right, Gary, I know that's a welcome sign for Yankee fans. Kevin Moss not getting that much chance to play this year, making the most of it tonight. Two run homer. Ricky Henderson, he singled his first time up. Blankenship on first and no outs, and Viola throws over there to keep him close. You're thinking about a stolen base opportunity. Blankenship, eight stolen bases on the season. He's been caught twice. Henderson knows how to handle that bat up there. He takes a called strike. Among things that Ricky does so well, he's a great leadoff man, he's got speed, he's got power, but something else that he does with a runner on first is that he can go deep into the count. Give you a chance to take that base. Sure, right? exactly. So they can do a number of things, hit and run here, or just a straight steal. You have to be aware of just about anything with Tony LaRusso. Pitch out, and there, there's, there's the point to your theory. They're making, they're making the Red Sox think, doing something that ordinarily they wouldn't like to do. The signs being given from Renee Latchman, the third base coach. Count is one and one. Blankenship not going. Henderson fouls it off. When you talk about Renee Latchman, can't help but think of his brother Marcel with the California Angels. He talked to him today and said that Marcel's okay, but they had some concerns about other members of the California Angels, so at this point, let's send along our regards. Absolutely. And our thoughts and hope that everything works out for the gentleman with the Angels. Especially to manager Buck Rogers, who's had to go back to Los Angeles for surgery and several injuries that he had. Our prayers are with you, Buck. Hope to see you back in the dugout soon. John Wathen is the interim manager for the Angels tonight down in Baltimore. Here's the one-two, and Henderson fouls it in the dirt. Jerry, you played 22 years Major League Baseball. You've been on a lot of planes and buses. You ever have anything like that happen to you? No, and we're going to stop talking about it right there. I don't want to tempt the baseball gods or get any kind of crazy thoughts in my head. Anderson checks Latchman again. 
Viola to the belt again. Blankenship has not shown yet in this at bat that he is really thinking about running. He hasn't had a terribly long lead, hasn't even faked going to second. Inside to Henderson. One thing that keeps base runners close off Frankie Viola is that he shortens that, actually abbreviates that high leg kick or he uses the slide step in his delivery to the plate. Doesn't give that base runner a chance to get a rhythm or to pick up anything that he does different. 2-2 two -two is inside and Viola has gone full to the first two batters here in the third inning. Counts full. Runner on first base, successful in eight of ten attempts. What are the chances of him being off and running on this pitch? I think they're good. Yeah, full count. I would almost bet on it. There you see the Orioles, after being swept by these A's, have jumped out one zip. Henderson, a hit and runner. Is it a run and hit? Doesn't matter because Blankenship's going to end up on third. And Henderson, the ground single to right, is two for two on the evening. Blankenship was going, and Henderson, with excellent bat control, hit it between the hole into right field. We talked about it earlier in Henderson's at bat is the simple fact that he could go deep into the count to keep the threat of his steal alive. And then when he has to deliver with the base runner going, gets a pitch on the outside corner, slaps it in between first and second, and the A's now have a threat hole that big. Look at that stumble mm. by Blankenship as he goes around second. He still had time to recover and easily make it to third base. So first and third, nobody out for the Oakland A's against Frank Viola here in the third. Boston leading at one zip on the homer by Wade Boggs and Carney Lansford, another pretty good guy manipulating the bat. Hounds won the shortstop. Here comes the runner from third. He will score. The only play is the force out of Henderson at second. So an RBI for Carney Lansford. Safe on the fielder's choice at first, and it's a 1-1 game. And there you go, a walk, a softly hit ground ball to right field through the hole, and a two-hopper to shortstop, and you manufactured a run. Two-hopper to shortstop with the infield playing back. Lansford knows in this situation he's either got to A, hit a fly ball so that the runner can score, or top of ball hit it to shortstop so at least the runner has a chance to come around of course you don't want to hit a ball too hard or whatever you can't really guide the ball but you want to try to stay out of the double play and he did so Jose Canseco up now with one gone and one on one run in really had his problems on this road trip he is now three of his last 30 trips to the plate three for 30 with only five RBIs and those are very un Jose like numbers to the back of Ken Kaiser, the umpire at second base tonight. Outside, 2-0 to Ken Seco. Jose injured his knee flying into the wall at Yankee Stadium last Sunday going after a ball. Earlier, injured his right shoulder and it's still nagging him. Down in the dirt, 3-0. And Frankie takes a little trip behind the plate or behind the mound, collect his thoughts, realizes that he doesn't want to put another runner in scoring position or actually on base. Not with you know who in the on deck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's gotten that big. We don't have to say his name. <laughs> Chopper to shortstop. One and two. The Sox turn the double play. They get out of the inning and they don't have to face Mark McGuire with runners on base. Oakland plates a run, though. After two and a half from Fenway, we're tied at one. Rob Deere came into the in evening hitting 205, but now about half of his hits are home runs. There's number 12. That second in the majors came off John Smiley. Gave them the 2-1 lead. The Twins have come back to tie it, and this will be our game. Sunday night, 8 Eastern, as you see Cecil and the Tigers take on the Twins. Right now, let's go back to our game at Fenway.
All right, Gary, we saw the swing of Rob Deere. He connected. This swing, Jose Canseco hits into a DP. He connected, but it just didn't go anywhere. Ground ball gets over the head of the pitcher, Frankie Viola, and right to Rivera, who makes the throw on the first base. Two things that we have going there. One is that shoulder might be hampering him on the inside pitch, and two, the knee might have given him some problems coming out of the box because he looks as if he just stumbled a bit, and they were easy to, uh, easily able to double him up. Tony Pena leads it off for the Boston Red Sox. His first appearance at the plate this evening. You see his average. Tony really been struggling, especially in the early innings. The newest stat I'd never seen before. Now let, let me throw this one at you. Tony Pena, he's hitting 208 for the season. But Jerry, did you know from the seventh inning on, he's hitting 316. Next, they're going to give us hang time on pop ups. There goes Pena in the right field. Back is Brocious, who went back and had to come in and make a basket catch. One gone. So Pena is retired, and Jody Reed, who popped up to the catcher Steinbach on the first pitch of the ball game, steps in. Reed, last two games. Against Seattle went five for eight. Scored three runs over the last uh, five games has been hitting at a 333 clip. Read off batter takes a look at strike one. Reed hitting very well here at home this season 345 at Fenway Park. Account. Watch the way that Reed stands up to the plate and approaches a pitcher like Stewart, like anybody. He takes that same approach with him in batting practice. Very disciplined. If the pitch is just a little bit outside or he doesn't want to try to swing at it, he'll take a pitch in BP. A lot of guys just go up there to get their swings in. Not Reed. He believes that the way you practice is the way you're going to play. Two balls and one strike to Jody Reed. He'll be followed by Mike Greenwell. Stewart falls behind him three and one. Lansford in a bit at third. The rest of the infield is straight away. Also right fielder Brocious in a little bit shallow. Ron Reed. 3-1 delivery from Stewart. Jody Reed is on with one out. Here in the bottom of the third inning. Well, Sunday night baseball at ESPN. Tonight our caravan goes to, or I should say Sunday night our caravan goes to Tiger Stadium. Where the Tigers and Twins are locked up in a good one tonight. Hopefully it'll be that way Sunday. Bill Kruger. 4-0 on the season for the Minnesota Twins, formerly of the Seattle Mariners. Frank Tanana set to go for the Tigers and of course Cecil Fielder who's been in a panic slump of late starting to break out although not hitting many home runs starting to make better contact we'll see if he makes contact Sunday could be two here for the A's nice play there by the shortstop of the Oakland A's Mike Bording who turns the DP and quickly Stewart and Oakland are out of the inning no runs no hits no errors and nobody left three full gone at Fenway we're tied at one. ESPN Major League Baseball is brought to you by ESPN Home Video. Producers and distributors of Legends of Baseball. Available at video and retail stores nationwide. Here at Fenway Park, as we go to the fourth, we're tied at one. You want to know how to execute the double play? Well, all you had to do was look at the play, last play of that last inning as Lance Blankenship and Mike Bordick turned it off. Jody Reed is the runner. Reed is the runner, sees that it's going to be a ground ball hit hard by Greenwell. He has to do everything he can to prevent a double play from happening. But look at the play by Mike Bordy. Gets, gets that ball, gets rid of it in a hurry to retire the A's in their top half of the inning. Mike McGuire, the leadoff batter here in the fourth, just got under that. And the Red Sox and Viola are glad he got under it. And Jody Reed goes out right in front of Ellis Burks and makes the catch. 
Going to say McGuire also did his part defensively in that double play with a nice stretch to his left to catch the throw from Bordick and uh, went for the downs that time. Just got under it, one gone. That's when you know the power hitter is just missing, Jerry, when he hits one straight away center way high up in the air. I like to watch the hitter's reaction after he does that because it tells everybody in the ballpark that he just missed his pitch. Terry Steinbach struck out swinging first time up in the second inning against Frankie V. Off speed pitch hammered foul. Steinbach looking fastball gets served a change up way out in front tried to stop that swing couldn't do so falls behind Viola. Two look at Steinbach and his 830 shadow there. <laughs> Didn't hit the razor before the game Terry. Bounced it foul. Of course, the guys like McGuire are 17 home. Are we going to see everybody wear a goatee now? Listen, if I felt that it would have changed my luck as far as pitching out of growing hair on my palms. <laughs> There's an obvious line there, Jerry, but I'm a gentleman. I won't. Uh... <laughs> I'll let that one go in the dirt. All right. 0 oh 2. The count to Steinbach. Strike three call. Steinbach has gone down swinging. Now he's gone down looking. We'll go back to Gary Miller. Tom, the Yanks just keep on going. Budweiser takes it to the Bronx, where Danny Trottable knocked in the third run of the game off Jamie Navarro. They've won seven of eight coming in. They take a three to one lead as the Brewers come to bat in the fourth. Let's go back to Fenway. Well, the $28 million man. You got the $29 million man out in the coast doing some whacking for the Mets. Danny Tartable doing his fair share for the Yankees of late since coming off the disabled list. Two gone here for the A's in the fourth. Willie Wilson fouls the first pitch off from Viola for strike one. Wilson bouncing out to shortstop in the second inning. Straight away, except for Boggs at third, who has to respect that speed from Wilson. There you see the way the infielder and the out infielders and outfielders are playing, Willie. Two and one. See the flag. Now, the flag behind home plate, where that is, it indicates it's blowing in, but the flag in at the stadium in center field is blowing hard from right to left. So the wind is blowing to left field if we can believe the flag inside the stadium. Swing and a miss. You can believe that Viola has struck out Willie Wilson. No runs, no hits, no errors, and nobody left. After three and a half, good pitcher's duel here at Fenway. 1-1. This is Boston's lone run of the night in the first inning. Wade Boggs and Jerry, does this look like the stroke of a power hitter? Not at all. Looks like someone who knows how to play Pepper with a green monster. And he does just that. Only he plays a little better than Pepper. That one goes over the wall. Well, he caught a little bit of wind, as they say at the America's Cup. A puff of wind down the left field line. The tail of the tape, that tape measure shot by Boggs, went all of 318 feet. That is, if you're to believe that 315 marker down there. A lot of people don't. Boggs, Jack Clark, and Phil Plantier, the first three up against Stewart here in the fourth, and a good ball again tonight, 1-1. One, one. Just fouled on the first baseline. One ball and two strikes on Wade Boggs. You would think that more pitchers would just throw the first pitch over the plate with Boggs. That is, he's going to go deep into the count, so go ahead, get ahead of him. Mm -hmm. But there you see Wade Boggs, who just this past weekend reached the 2,000 hit plateau. That's the good news. The better news is he did it faster than any of those guys we just saw on the, on the screen. There goes another one to left field. This one is off the green monster. Henderson misplays it, and Boggs will trot into second with a double. So Wade Boggs, perhaps that's what he was trying to do the first time, just played ping pong with the wall. Not much Ricky could do with it. Stopped it with his chest. Boggs would have had a double anyway, so no error there. 
To finish that thought, you would think a pitcher would just throw the first pitch over the plate to try to get ahead of Boggs, but he is such a good hitter with two strikes that he can make whatever necessary adjustment he should. And in Fenway Park, where he hits so well, he gets a pitch out over the plate and just slaps the left field. He's gotten under a couple of them, one a home run and the other a double. So a leadoff double for Wade Boggs. He's on second, and Jack Clark, the designated hitter, who popped out to second base in the first inning, try and bring him home. Feast or famine this year for Clark. Two home runs, both of them in Kansas City, about a week or so ago, 14 RBIs. And against right-handers, he's really struggled this year, Jerry, hitting at 132. Fouls one off right down the middle of the plate, one and one. Jack Clark's a veteran ball player, and he knows what should be done in a situation like this. It's a 1-1 ball game. We're in the fourth inning. He's got to try to get that runner to third so that he can be there with one man out so they can get him on the sacrifice fly, the ground ball, whatever. But Clark is such a big swinger and he likes to pull the ball so much, I don't think the chances of him hitting the ground ball to the right side are, are that great at all. He's looking now for something he, that he can hit out. Yeah, back control has never been one of Clark's strong points, and, and this is not a knock on Jack. He is a home run hitter. He's a power hitter, a pull hitter. He does have power to right field, right center field, but primarily his moon shots go to left. He's paid to hit the ball out of the park. Two balls and two strikes. Clark, a big hockey fan as well. He was at Boston Garden last night. Every time I see Jackie, he never wants to talk about baseball. He's telling me how great he thought Mario Lemieux was. And I said, well, it's a pretty good judge of talent there, Jack. Hangs around with a lot of the, the Boston Bruins in the offseason. Boggs on second, nobody out. 2-2 two -two count to Clark. Gets under this. It should be an easy play for either Blankenship or Brocious. Brocious calls him off, and Boggs will stay at second. Let's go to Gary Miller. Tom Budweiser takes you to Tiger Stadium. Haven't seen this guy in a while. Haven't seen this in a while. April 22nd is the last time Cecil Fielder homered. John Smiley had given up only three all season. He gave up two in this game already. That three-run shot put the Tigers ahead 5-2. to two. Back to Fenway. Well, like days of old at Tiger Stadium, the Tigers hitting homers, and Cecil is, uh, has been absent of late, but there he goes tonight. He's back at it. John Smiley making his first start at Detroit. Welcome to Detroit, John. <laughs> yeah, it's not Three Rivers, is it? Or the Metrodome. One gone and one on. Boggs at second. The batter is Phil Plantier, popped out the third. You know, as bad a start as Cecil and the Tigers got off to, they're only four games under 500 and only seven games out of first place. And a long way to go. Two and all to Plantier. Phil steps out. This is a guy that last September, Jerry, had everything. Looked like he had the world by the tail. Every ball he hit seemed to be a line drive. Got a lot of clutch hits in the month of September for the Red Sox. Had the elbow surgery in the offseason, and you don't know if that's the reason he's struggling, but he is struggling. It could also be the fact that the opposition knows how to make adjustments against you. 3-0 and count to plant here. Briggs waits in the on-deck circle. You see Plantier struggling whether runners are on base or not. Would really lift his spirits if he could bring home Boggs. Outfield shades him around the left. And the count is full. The second time Plantier has been up there with a full count. Saw nine pitches from Dave Stewart his first time at the plate. Mainly was just falling off those fastballs prior to popping up foul of Carney Lansford. 
So the count again full. Sees even more pitches from Stewart. Let's see what Stewart does with him this time. Three balls, two strikes. Boggs on second with the leadoff double and one gone. Bottom of the fourth tied at one. Another fastball from Stewart. This one up in the strike zone. Plantier likes to keep his hands in close to his body. But then as that pitch approaches, watch what happens. He gets them started, gets them back, and just generates a lot of bat speed through the strike zone. That time just a bit behind on the Dave Stewart fastball. Center fielder Ellis Burks awaiting his turn at Stewart. Three and two count to Plantier. There's a line drive to center field. Back goes Wilson. Back to the track. It is off the wall. Boggs will trot in and Plantier is on second with a double. The way Wilson looked up, you wondered if that thing wasn't going to get over the wall. The 379 mark, but a ringing double for Plantier. mentioned earlier in Plantier's at bat the problems that he's had with runners on base this time he gets a fastball down in the strike zone a little out over the plate and he drives it to left center showing pretty good power in most ballparks that's a home run but here in Fenway that's just off the wall nonetheless it's good enough to drive in a run and puts the Red Sox ahead two to one so a pair of doubles here is put Stewart and the gaze behind two to one and here's Ellis Burks called strike one Birch his first time up struck out looking currently hitting at 241 run in one out pop up to left field Willie Wilson should have rather Ricky Henderson should have an easy play whoa he lost that thing in the lights had to go back on it. Let's go to Gary Miller. Tom would take it to Yankee Stadium where New York had a 3-1 lead and then the Cadillac. Franklin Stubbs connects off Melito Perez. That two-run shot is his fifth of the season. It's tied at three in the four. Back to Fenway Park. All right, balls flying out of Yankee Stadium tonight. Ricky Henderson had, uh, well, he made that one an adventure in left field, Jerry. He's talking to somebody. We don't know who's really listening, but Ricky ran with his head down chasing that fly ball thinking that it was right behind shortstop but that's not the way it happens here in Fenway the breeze picked it up a little bit and nearly carried it over his head could he have lost that in the lights in the first baseline looking up there maybe so looked like he had a beat on it then all of a sudden whoa -oh. so two outs here for the Red Sox Scott Cooper who walked his first time up 281 average and the count is now one and one. That's from high third base. Ricky charges in, sees that the ball's going to carry a little bit more, recovers, and is able to pull that ball in. Foul on the third base line. Again. The hitter's reaction often tells the story of what he felt that he should have done that pitch. Burks had a pitch that he felt he could hit out, got under it just a bit, popped it up, and as he ran down first base, flipped the bat back toward the dugout. One and two to count to the first baseman Cooper. Ground ball to second. Blankenship eats it up over McGuire. And the Red Sox are gone here in the inning, but not before they take the lead. Two to one. Ever wonder what it looks like the other side of the green monster? That's it. Here in Boston, two to one Red Sox. The Blue Jays are in Comiskey. Jack McDowell trying to become the Major's first eight-game winner, but Manny Lee hits a bullet to right field off him. Pat Border's off and running, going for third. Here's Warren Newsom up and gunning the throw, and he is meat. That cut down Devon White's homer to a two-run shot. Jays leading two to nothing over McDowell. Back to Fenway. McDowell trying for the second time to notch win number eight on the season. Frank Viola trying tonight for his fifth win here at Fenway Park and his sixth win of the season. Scott Broch is the right fielder. Singled his first time up in the second inning. Leads it off for the A's. Two to one Boston here at top of the fifth. One ball and one strike to Brocious. 
Roche is playing in right, usually occupied by Jose Canseco. Canseco's knee and shoulder bothering him. Jose has been moved to the DH. I know what you're saying. Who is Scott Brocious? Well, 25 years of age, made his first major league appearance last season after hitting 286 in 65 games for Tacoma. Little looper in back of Jody Reed at second. Will it fall in? Here comes Plantier, and there's one gone here in the fifth inning. Well, Frank Viola, of course, uh, long, long time ago, don't want to make him too old, pitched in the College World Series. And ESPN's coverage commences on May 29th from Rosenblatt Stadium in Omaha. The winners from eight regionals will compete. Defending champion Louisiana State beat Wichita State for the title last season. Such players as Roger Clemens, Will Clark, Bobby Thigpen, Robin Ventura, Pete Cavilla, and this man, former St. John's Redman, Frank Viola, have competed in the College World Series. It's a great event. And you'll see just about every pitch of the College World Series right here on ESPN. Here's the shortstop, Mike Bordick. Fielder's choice in the second inning. It goes after a Frankie Viola changeup. It just seems to die as it comes to home plate. Has all the illusion of a fastball. And as a hitter, you're thinking fastball, you go after it. And as you complete your swing, you watch the ball just kind of float. Meanwhile, high fastball evens the count at one. If yeah, Viola's got that nice, easy motion, no matter what pitch is coming at you, and you're right, Jerry, his changeup takes forever to get there. High again, two and one. He credits former pitching coach, Minnesota pitching coach, Johnny Padres, for teaching him that changeup. But you got to give credit to Viola because he learned it and learned it well. Just low. Viola wanted that pitch. It's three and one now to Bordick. If you're up at the plate against Frank Viola, you see a lot of arms, a lot of legs come at you. So trying to pick that ball up could be difficult. Right back through the legs of Viola, ground single to center. Bordick almost got himself a pitcher. As it is, he records a hit for the A's, and there's one on with one gone. Let's go to Gary Miller. Tom Budweiser takes you to the Bronx, where they are bombing. Don Mattingly with a shot off Jamie Navarro. He doubles in a couple. Kelly and Gallego score. He would score on a sack fly, and then Danny Tartable hit his third home run of the year. Jamie Navarro had given up only one all season, two in the inning in the game, and he's gone. Long gone, I would guess. Yankees coming only two and a half out. That surprises a lot of people, Jerry. Nobody really expected the Yankees to do anything. Got off to a great start that first week of the season. And it's helped carry them to where they are today. Just two and a half games out as play begins tonight. I think the roughest part of the season for the Yanks was their first West Coast trip. They were swept by the Oakland A's and wrapped a couple of games in Seattle as well. They got back home and Toronto slumping. The Yankees playing well. Looks like it's going to be a race in the East, at least for now, where a lot of people thought it was going to be the Jays and everybody else. Red Sox only four back starting the evening. One on one, the count of Lance Blankenship, who walked and scored the Oakland run back in the third. Blankenship walked. He went over to third on a single by Henderson in the third and came home on a fielder's choice. RBI off the bat of Cardi Lansford. The runner is Bordick. And Viola checks him back. Bunch of those standings, just so you can see it graphically. The Blue Jays come in a half a game ahead of Baltimore. The Yanks, you see, just two and a half back. Boston four. Milwaukee losing tonight, but coming in only six back. Detroit, after a horrendous start, is seven back. The Tribe, as usual, is the only team out of the race in May. Two and one to count to the batter, Blankenship.
One out. Mike Wardick, the runner for Oakland at first. Top of the fifth. Two and two. Wonder what he was guessing this time. Takes the fastball right down the middle. Viola with that good off speed pitch. Maybe Blankenship thinks that at this point we're going to see a change up, maybe a breaking ball. But Frankie Fulham, that's the wily old veteran in him. Got another fastball, knocked it down the right field line. There goes the runner, Bordick around second to third. They're going to send him home, though, no, to hold him there. A double for Lance Blankenship. He got another fastball, Jerry, and this time he made no mistake. If there's a mistake on anybody's part, it might be Frankie Viola. Two strikes, or two balls, two strikes. Ball up in the strike zone. And Blankenship just drives it to right field, attempting to hit behind the runner. He did that and did it well. Puts two runners in scoring position. With the top of the order coming up, Ricky Henderson coming up already has two hits. So the A's really have their biggest threat of the evening coming up. So Bordick motors on over to third. Blankenship on the double. Has put two runners in scoring position. Pena goes out to talk to Viola. Nothing doing in the Red Sox bullpen, at least at this moment. However, a collect call may be being placed in a few batters if things uh, keep deteriorating. But Thompson wondering what to do. He's got Ricky Henderson up. Henderson, all he's done tonight, a couple of singles. Two for two, Ricky has raised that batting average up to 277. Very dangerous position here. First delivery to him, a ball. Henderson has really been raising his game, as you see in all areas, the last nine games. Hitting 242 with runners in scoring position this season. Eight out of 33 chances with runners in scoring position. Two and all to count to Henderson with the base open. He'll be very careful to Ricky, I would think. Can't afford to be too careful because you got Carney Lansford coming up next. Lansford hits particularly well here in Fenway Park. He gets on, then it's Conseco McGuire. So the importance of this inning is the fact that the A's had the bottom of their order set the table for the guys at the top. Lansford knocked in the only Oakland run of the evening back in the third inning. The 3 0 is a called strike in the outside corner. Anderson has that right foot in the very back of the line, the batter's box. Gives him just a split second more time to look at the pitches from Frank Viola. And a big one coming up here, three and one. Runners on second and third, and one out. Anderson slaps a single to center. The A's are going to take the lead. Here comes Bordick. Here comes Blankenship. Ricky Henderson is three for three. And Oakland has taken the lead in this baseball game, three to two. Well, he didn't hit it hard, but he hit it and hit it in the right spot. One of the problems pitching too carefully to a hitter who does well against you. You try to get him to go after a pitch that you want him to hit and fall behind an account. You have to come across the plate with a strike. And you have to, it really narrows the strike zone. And it really narrows your selection of pitches. So Henderson just sits on a fastball, gets jammed a little bit, but still strong enough to drop it over the infield and drive in two for the Oakland A's. Nothing Ellis Burks could do about it. Henderson actually hit that one on the trademark. You could hear the bat crack a little bit up here in the press box. Ricky sort of owns Viola, 326 lifetime hitter against Frankie V, and three for three tonight won't hurt that average. Not a bit. Pitching coach Rich Gale of the Red Sox out to talk to Viola. Probably reminding him, among things, that we're still in this ball game. So let's keep your wits about you. I realize it was a tough pitch. But Henderson likes to steal. You know that. Don't lose sight of it in what's already happened. So two runs in. The A's have taken a three to two lead. And Henderson, that's the added headache. He's the runner at first base, so you got to concern yourself with him. Lansford flew out deep to right field in the first inning. 
And had an RBI there. It goes Ricky, the pitch out to Pena. Henderson dives. The throw goes off the helmet of Henderson, who wanted to get up and go to third, but Jody Reed in part. To make that Rivera in part was draped over him. Now you can see Ricky looking to Ken Kaiser saying, hey, isn't that interference? Kaiser says no. Well, he's a former wrestler. That's not interference in wrestling. That's just body contact. Henderson having a good laugh of it. Interesting the way Ricky Henderson got his lead. He had a walking lead off of Viola. Had three or four steps before that ball was even delivered. But it's a pitch out. Tony Pena, who has a strong arm, has been gunning down base runners this year better than he has the past two years. Makes a strong throw. Hits Henderson in the helmet. Caroms away. Ricky trying to get up so that he can advance to third. Stumbles a couple of times over the body of Rivera and can't advance. 20 has stole a base of the season for Henderson. He's in scoring position. Lansford has the count go to one and one. Watch the noggin of Henderson here. He Look takes at this. this one right off the helmet. Look at this, this step, the lead that he got. He was in motion when Viola delivered the pitch. I think that's oh. one of the things that Rick Gale was talking about. Be aware, Henderson likes to run in a situation like this. Didn't hit him in the helmet. Hit him, uh, we're told, off the elbow. We do know it hit him somewhere and bounced off toward left field. Henderson still laughing about it. Maybe it hit him on a funny bone. <laughs> yeah. The older nerve, maybe, right? We are talking about that earlier. <laughs> See, we were so technical about it. In fact, if you notice that in so many press guides from the teams that now we have medical a medical glossary listed as Viola attempts to make a play at Henderson. Very, very close. The old daylight play. If Viola sees uh, daylight between Henderson and the shortstop, he goes. Rivera snuck in behind Ricky Henderson. That was a very, very close play. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, one and one to Lansford, inside for ball two. Two runs in here for the Oakland A's. They've come from behind to take a three to two lead. You take a look from the camera high atop the left field foul pole or nearby. Anderson taking his lead and Lansford drives the ball to the right side of the infield who advanced the runner. 4-3 for the second out of the inning. Two gone and Henderson's at third. Chatting with another pretty good hitter, Mr. Boggs. Ricky takes a tour around the field, gets a chance to visit with everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know what Jose Canseco did here to the folks of Boston, but every time he comes up, he gets booed more loudly than the time before, and he's 0 for 2 tonight. I can't, I can't tick him off here in Beantown. Hit into an inning ending double play in the third inning. Canseco's average is now dipped to 219. Inside corner for strike one. Canseco likes to get that head of that bat out on the ball, extend those arms. That's where his power is. Here's some power to left field. This will play Henderson off the base of the Green Monster. A single for Canseco, but he'll take it the way he's been going. You just saw that graphic. Jose has been in a nosedive of late, but he gives the A's a two-run lead at 4-2 to two with a single to left scoring Henderson. The point that I'm trying to make with Canseco is the fact that he has that wide-open stance to prevent that ball from jamming him when it's inside. This time he gets around on the inside pitch, down in the strike zone, hits a line drive off the wall and left. Played perfectly by Greenwell to hold Canseco to a single. Mark McGuire takes a called strike. Mark it into a fielder's choice to end the first inning and popped out to second in the fourth inning. I know I said this earlier, but it bears mentioning again the bottom guys in the batting order set the table, Bordick and Blankenship, as they've done so all season for the big guys in the Oakland lineup. Henderson gets them home with a single, steals second, goes to third on a ground ball. Comes around to score the third run inning. All of this as a result of the bottom players in the batting order. In the Boston bullpen, Greg Harris now starting to warm up. Off speed pitch, McGuire way out ahead of it, one and two. 
I just wonder if McGuire was reading that pitch. He seemed to wait, hold back, hold back, but the ball never got to the plate. Frankie might have taken something off a changeup, a slow curveball. McGuire waited on it, just couldn't connect. As far out in front as he was on that, you knew it was some sort of off-speed delivery. Change or curve. Doesn't bite after that one. Two and two, the count to Mark McGuire. Three runs in, four hits in the inning so far for the A's. Who come from two to one down to four to two in front against Frank Viola and the Red Sox. Two balls, two strikes, two outs. Delivery to McGuire. Got him fishing for something low. Swing and a miss. And that's it. But three runs on four hits. No errors in one left. As McGuire goes down for the count, the A's leave the field going to the bottom of the fifth with a 4-2 lead over the Boston Red Sox. We'll be back to Fenway in just a moment. We're kicking off your Memorial Day weekend, hopefully tonight, and we'll end it on Monday with a triple header, the Dodgers and the Cardinals. Most of you will see Eric Davis and Ozzy Smith and company. Then at 7.30 Eastern time, most of you will see the Reds and the Mets, Larkin, Bonilla and company. And at 10.30 Eastern time, and that's not enough for you, Crime Dog, Fred McGriff and the Padres hosting Barry Bonds and the Pittsburgh Pirates. A Memorial Day triple header to remember right here on ESPN. And of course, uh, many of you in other parts of the country will see alternate games, but all of you will see a triple header on Monday. I'm brushing up on my French, Jerry. I have to go to Montreal on Monday. I better brush up on my Spanish with Philippe Alou, now the, the manager. The expose. Luis Rivera leads it off for the Red Sox here in the bottom of the fifth, trailing Oakland 4-2. Rivera bounced out to third baseman Lansford in the second inning. I'm a little bit surprised that the Expos fired Tom Runnels. Team wasn't winning, but they weren't really terribly out of it. 17 and 21. Yeah, I guess there's more to it than meets the eye. Usually is. Rivera pops it up into short left field. Henderson coming in, calling off the shortstop, and Ricky puts it away. Let's go to Gary Miller. Tom, we take it at Comiskey, where Jack McDowell is looking to be the Major's first eight-game winner, but he's coming off a rocky outing of just three innings in his last start, and Kelly Gruber has hit the second home out of the night off him. Devon White also tatered, and McDowell and the White Sox are being shut out by Guzman, 3-0 in the fifth. Good pitching matchup, McDowell and Guzman. Mr. Guzman getting the best of it tonight. Runs in cycles. You know, McDowell looks unbeatable the first six weeks of the season, and he'll get rocked his last time out, get rocked again tonight. He's been the first to admit, though, that he's had some of, uh, in some of those victories, that he's had some great defense behind him, plus a lot of run support. One gone for the Sox here in the fifth, trailing four to two. Tony Pena flew out to right field his first time up. Huh? Here's the old one to him. Bounces it to McGuire. Nice play to keep the ball in front of him to Stewart. And that is as good a play as you'll see from first base. McGuire really had to show cat-like reactions to keep that thing going from going into right field. He didn't win a gold glove last year, though. There are a lot of people that felt that he should. But this is the kind of play that Mark McGuire gives you as a pitcher. His first concern is keeping that ball from going through the infield, maybe knocking it down, but he goes one better. He snags it recovers nicely and feeds the pitcher who's supposed to be there covering the base. Little things like that. These things don't show up in your scorebook, but this is what the Oakland A's trademark has become. Fundamental baseball and finding a way to win. So two guy quickly for the Sox. The leadoff hitter Jody Reed. His third look at Dave Stewart. He popped out to open the game and he walked back in the third inning. Stewart ahead of him, no balls and one strike. Dave Stewart's got the lead, four to two, and at least for the first two hitters, he seems a lot more comfortable out there. Remember, he's a slow starter in a ball game. If you get to him, you've got to get to him early. He has a lead in the later innings. He can be tough. But the A's can be tough because they got the X down in the bullpen. Ball one. Stewart's done quite well in his career against the Red Sox, 12 and five lifetime, ERA of over four, which indicates he gets pretty good support when he faces the Sox. Last season, he pitched against Boston three times and had one victory and no losses. Last year, though, Stewart fell, and it's a fall for a pitcher of his stature to 11 and 11. That's hard to believe. The 
It just shows you how important location of your pitches happens to be. Terry Steinbach talked about it a little bit earlier. That Stu gets that fastball, he tries inside just a little bit over the plate, or the one outside goes over the plate. These are major league hitters. They make the adjustment. Reed pops it up. Steinbach throws away the mask, but Lansford calls him off. And one, two, three, go the Red Sox here in the fifth. No runs, no hits, no errors, and nobody left. We go to the top of the sixth. The A's leading Boston 4-2. to two. Last out for the Red Sox in that last inning, the bottom of the fifth. Now, they're trailing by two. Nobody on. Foul pop. Why run it out? Well, why? Because he's a hustler. Because he's a gamer, and he cares. He knows the ball's going to be fouled, but he runs down to the bases and is going around him as if he hit the ball off the wall, and it could have been a double. You've got to show some hustle, and you've got to show some care and concern about the way you play. That's what Jody Reed did with that at bat. Terry Steinbach leads it off here for the A's in the sixth against Frank Viola. Steinbach is struck out swinging. He's also struck out looking. Viola really labored in that fifth inning. His total pitch count coming into this inning was 80. 24 of those within the fifth inning alone. Where the A's scored three times to take a 4-2 to two lead. 2-2 two and two, the count to Steinbach. Terry has had a tough time with Frank Viola tonight. You don't believe me? Well, here's his first at bat in the second inning. Goes after a breaking pitch down in the dirt. This time he gets a fastball on the inside corner. And second K was back in the floor. He may never talk to you again. You, you, you spoke with him on camera before the game. You know how superstitious catchers are. They can be, but the, re the final return isn't in. Let's see what he does. He may have a great game from here on out. Two balls and two strikes to Terry Steinbach. Viola bounces that one up there, running the count full. <laughs> Willie Wilson swinging that lighted bat on deck. He also has been a strikeout victim tonight. Steinbach took a little extra time getting in the box, maybe thinking about what pitch Viola might throw or what he might try to do with this pitch if it's over the plate. Let's see how he reacts. 3-2 delivery to him. Ground ball to short. Rivera's got it. Got plenty of time and one gone. Let's join Gary Miller in the studio. Tom at Tiger Stadium, twins trailing 5-2 to two to Mark Leiter and the Tigers when Greg Gagne hits a shot up the middle. Lou Whitaker cuts it off, but Harper scored. Now here comes Pedro Munoz. He is me. It is 5-3 to three now as the Tigers lead the Twins. You can see him here 8 Eastern Sunday night. Back to you, Tom. All right, Gary, I'm going to start calling you the butcher. Everybody who's out is meat. I like the other one, denied. <laughs> is that prime rib or uh, <laughs> whatever? Willie Wilson swings and fouls Viola's first pitch back for strike one. Wilson bounced the short in the second, struck out swinging. One of five strikeouts tonight for Viola. That one was back in the fourth. And Wilson down 0-2. Well, Memorial Day means the start of our coverage of the French Open on ESPN. Coverage begins at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, 6 a.m. Los Angeles Time, where Jerry Royce will be up with his poisson. Watching the great uh, tennis from the red clay of Roland Garros Stadium, defending champs Jim Courier and Monica Sellis had the men's and women's contingent at the French Open. Sellis has won two straight French Opens. Going for the hat trick this year. Monday, 9 a.m. Jambon and fromage omelette with that croissant. All right, that's cheese and something, right? And ham. And ham. Yeah. All those trips to Montreal, they had to learn to read a menu. <laughs> Now, see, if you'd have spoken to me Tuesday, I would have understood you. <laughs> Wilson gets jammed inside. Count remains 0-2. Boy, what a full slate of action we have. French Open in the morning, three mm -hmm. baseball games. Maybe in time, maybe during sometime during the day, people get out and get a chance to barbecue. No, nah, because they got to watch Lime Rock. <laughs> Racing from uh, Lime Rock, Connecticut. Wilson strikes out. Let's check it again with Gary Miller. 
Tom, another update for you. We had dual one-hitters between Tom Glavin and Dennis Martinez. Then he gave up a hit in the sixth. Check Dion trying to track Donovan Calderon over his head. He doubles in Marquise Grissom. That's the only one of the game so far. The Braves bat in the seventh in a pitcher's duel deluxe. Back to Fenway. Well, Yvonne Calderon coming off the disabled list and delivering for the Expos tonight. Two gone here for the A's. Scott Brocious, one for two with a single in this game. Single back in the second inning was rubbed out on a force play. Rubbed out. Sounds like he got in trouble with the mob. <laughs> he was forced at second. One-one delivery is hit into right field. Plantier is there. And the Red Sox are out of the inning. No runs, no hits, no errors. Three up, three down for the A as we go to the bottom of the sixth. Boston at night on a beautiful May evening. Four to two open. I couldn't understand why major leaguers weren't better bunters. They've been working on it. I'll tell you, the Bronx Bombers living up to their name tonight. Red Sox with some work to do here in the bottom of the sixth. Mike Greenwell, Wade Boggs, and Jack Clark. The first three against Stewart with Carney Lansford playing it on the grass. Greenwell looks at ball one. Red Sox fans, some rhythmic applause, trying to get their club going. 2-0 oh the count. And this is the area, the danger area for Stewart. Most of last year and so far this year, Jerry, the sixth, seventh inning. He doesn't necessarily lose velocity, but when it falls apart for him, this has been the part of the game. First three pitches are any indication he's missed with all three of them. The other problem that he has is that he is wild in the strike zone, getting a pitch over the plate, and it's just too good for the hitter to lay off of, and they've been hitting that pitch and hitting it well. Plantera waits the 3-0. Inside corner for strike one, or Greenwell, I should say. Pardon me, Mike Greenwell. Greenwell left field, Plantera in right field tonight. 39 and 29, respectively. Called strike two, and Greenwell looks back. And Vic Voltaggio is if to say, you got to be kidding. Yeah, it's hard for us to tell from up here, particularly from that angle, whether that's a strike or not, but looked like a pretty good pitch. Greenwell begs the differ. Greenwell swings and lost it deep to right field. Brocious goes back to the warning track along with Wilson, and Willie Wilson tracks it down in the deepest part of the ballpark, about 410 feet away from home plate. So much is said about Fenway Park being a home run hitter's ballpark. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Oh. It just depends on your point of view. You've got the wall in left field that's mighty inviting, but you also have that area in center field and you could you could actually grow a crop out there. There's so much room <laughs> and never have a ball go out that way and never have to worry about losing anything. Wade Boggs steps up solo homer in the first inning for Boggs. The 79th of his storied career and a double in the fourth inning to lead it off and he later scored. So he has scored both Boston runs tonight. Any other part of the ballpark, and this ball hit by Mike Greenwell would have been long gone. In any other park, it's long gone. But he hits it to the long, longest part of this ballpark. Two and one to count to Boggs, counting tonight's home run. From 1988 until this evening, Wade Boggs has hit 23 home runs. In 1987 alone, he hit 24. I don't know what that says, except that maybe Wade was going for the power in 87 and sacrificing a little bit for the average. Although to him sacrificing, he's going from 370 to 360. Three and one to count to Boggs. Another full count. Stewart ran four full counts in the first two innings. A couple more here in the sixth. Flirting with danger. You know, there comes a point in every pitcher's career 
where he has to face the reality of the situation. Dave Stewart, 34, going on 35 years old. He hasn't lost a whole lot of velocity, but he's lost some movement on his pitches, and it seems to affect him later in the ballgame, whereas he used to throw a lot of pitches uh, and complete these ballgames. Now, 7th, 8th, and ninth innings, he seems to have a little bit of trouble. Foul back by Boggs, who's been struggling here at Fenway. On the season against right-handed pitching, Boggs has only been hitting 218 before tonight. And before tonight, he's only been hitting 228 here at Fenway Park. But a home run and a double and two at-bats raise both those figures. Again, the 3-2. Boggs lost it to center. Wilson should have room. No! Whoa! Another shot! Out of the park! Wilson took off after that. I thought he was going to catch it on the warning track. Wade Boggs must have retro rockets on the ball tonight. We've seen Wade Boggs do what he does so well, and that's hit the ball to the opposite field. For the third time in a row, goes deep into the count. Third time in a row, he goes to the opposite field. He's got under all three pitches. Two of them, he's driven for a home run. This one hits the top of the monster and bounces into the netting. And look at the, the look on Dave Stewart's face. Disbelief. Wade Boggs, two home runs tonight. I'll tell you, they teach you early on in this profession not to watch the baseball. Watch the fielder. As soon as that ball went out to center field, I'm watching Willie Wilson, and he looks like he had a beat on that one, and I thought for all the world he's going to catch it on the warning track. All of a sudden, his shoulders slump. His head looks up as if to say, not again. The ball is jumping off the bat of Wade Boggs, and it's a four to three ball game. I apologize if I misled you, but I was generally surprised that Boggs got that one out. You know what he's thinking right now? I'm wondering where you're going to be tomorrow night. He'd like <laughs> to talk to you before the ball game. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's right. You know that half hour documentary? It's now an hour. <laughs> one one count to Clark. Well. Stewart runs full count after full count. It has cost him a couple of times tonight to Wade Boggs. First two home runs of the season for Boggs. Clark fouls it back. Count remains one and two. I'm starting to think my eyes are going on me. I didn't think that thing had a chance to get out of here. It's difficult to call from up here in the booth, but you got to remember the ball hit the left field, the wind blowing out. You can't always tell from the flag. It gets above the flag. There's a little bit of a gust. See so you pick that ball up. One and two, and Clark stays alive again. The other thing to remember, the way that outfielders play the ball here is that they play maybe... 30 feet into the grass to play the carom to see exactly which way the ball is going to come off the wall. So they stop short, whereas a lot of other ballparks, they take it all the way mm -hmm. to the limit. That's what Wilson did. He, he stopped short, and I got crossed up. I thought, okay, he's under it. All of a sudden, Gonzo, one and two to Clark in the dirt. Two balls, two strikes. I'm talking about the wind blowing to left, and the flag certainly indicates that, and that's right in the area of the park where Boggs ball got a little jump got up there in that wind and left. Wind may have given an assist but Boggs hit that ball well. Two balls two strikes to Clark with one gone. Red Sox mounting a comeback. It's now four to three Oakland advantage. And way out in front of that one was Clark. And they're booing Jack the Ripper on his way back to the dugout. 0 for 3 on the night now is Clark, who's had tough sledding against Dave Stewart. Only the third strikeout on the evening for Dave Stewart. Changes speeds this time to Jack Clark. Looks like a split finger or a fork ball. Takes a little bit off. Clark sees fastball. Gets the bad head out in front. Just a little bit early. So Phil Plantier steps up with two gone. Plantier doubled and knocked in Wade Boggs with the Red Sox second run of the night back in the fourth inning. Ball one to it.
An exaggerated crouch of Plantier called strike. Something to think about with Wade Boggs, how well he hits here at Fenway Park. His contract's up at the end of the season, and one would have to question his value to a team that doesn't play here at Fenway Park. He's extremely valuable to the Red Sox because of his ballpark. Strike two. Then again, you have to wonder also, you put Wade Boggs on a team with AstroTurf, the way he hits the ball on the ground and stuff, that might not add to his hit total. Broken bat over third base. Fair foul. It is a foul ball into the stands. Plantier goes back for some new lumber. Dave Stewart reached the 100 pitch limit. And he seemed to have problems when he gets to that point. He's still throwing strong. But he's still throwing strikes. But are they quality strikes? And how long can he go? They have the Saber Dennis Eckers lead down in the bullpen. And Plantier taking some time, getting some lumber. As Stewart rests on the mound there, you mentioned that Boggs' contract is coming up. I know who's got some work to do. Sandy Alderson of the A's. Twelve players eligible for free agency after the season. Twelve. The A's haven't been shy in the past of spending the money to keep things together. One and two, the count to Phil Plantier. Red Sox trailing 4-3 with two gone here in the sixth. Ground ball to second base. Blankenship with the easy put out, and the Red Sox are gone. But another solo home run for Wade Boggs after six full here at Fenway Park. Red Sox trail Oakland 4-3. Massachusetts, we go to the seventh inning. The Oakland A's and the Boston Red Sox, Tom Mees and Jerry Royce. Glad you can be with us on ESPN's Friday Night Baseball. Good game tonight, 4-3. A's in front. Viola and Stewart taking their teams into the seventh inning, and both Hobson and Larusa have to be pleased at that. Mike Bordick, one for two on the evening, singled and scored his last time up in the fifth. First man up against Frank Viola. Larusa sees Bordick go ahead of Viola. Two balls, no strike. that the wheels aren't always turning Jerry but one run game seventh inning La Russa and Hobson so they really start to think about strategy in a big way well, definitely because now you, you get into your setup men and your closers to one which Tony does so well and it, it's been documented everywhere but also there's an added dimension here in Boston and that's the fact the ballpark comes into play there is really not a lead that's safe in Fenway Park 3-1 pitch to Bordick. Pounds it to the hole. Nice play. Revere, does he have the gun to get him? He does. <laughs> Little Luis Rivera going towards the left field line. Gets his man. You're in the seventh inning of a game where you're behind by a run. You need a play to keep, to keep yourself from possibly getting into trouble. You get a play like this from Luis Rivera throws it while having his momentum go toward third base and is still able to retire Mike Bordy with an assist on Scott Cooper's stretch. It's a nice little scoop there by Cooper sort of a half trap to keep the ball in the glove and show it to the umpire. And Frank Viola an even 100 pitches and counting as he delivers to Lance Blankenship. Blankenship one for one on the night walked and scored in the third doubled and scored in the fifth. Ninth man of the Oakland order. Ricky Henderson on deck. Slap to Reed at second. That thing ate him up. They'll give him a single on that. I would think into center field. Blanket ship is on with his second hit of the night. Very tough play for Jody Reed who got over there. But very tough bounce. Viola got one pretty good play from an infielder. He needed another one. On this hard shot to Jody Reed. Reed thinks he should have had the ball. Ball eludes him, goes into center field. And again, it's the bottom of the order that sets the table for the Oakland A's. Let's see this time if it has the same effect that it did back in the fifth inning. 
Well, the crowd booing the decision of the official score to call it a base hit, but I'd like to see anybody in this crowd get down there and try and feel that thing. That was a rocket. Nothing we could do with it. Battle it looked like it just plain ate him up. Ricky Henderson has eaten Frank Viola up. Single to left, single to right, single to center. Knocked in a run, has a stolen base, has scored a run. Other than that, he's done nothing. And unbeknownst to a lot of fans here, Henderson, with tonight's game in a leadoff capacity, has tied Eddie Yost, the former walking man, for most games played by a leadoff hitter, 1,729. Just another stop on to Cooperstown for Mr. Henderson. Henderson in, in his last to bat in the fifth inning, as we take a look at this graphic with leadoff hitters, all-time games played, went deep into the count off of Frankie Viola and was able to have a hit and run single, which set up another run. Let me amend what I said. He has tied the American League record. Of the so Lou Brock and Pete Rose ahead of Henderson. Called by home plate umpire Vic Voltaggio. Looks like Harris still warming up in the Boston bullpen. Blankenship takes his lead off first with one gone. Anderson takes three balls and one strike, and Viola and Voltaggio are having a debate. This could get real interesting. Here comes manager Hudson, wants to keep his pitcher in the game, and I hope you can't read lips, friend. Not much of a debate about it at all. Frankie has taken exception to a couple of calls on inside pitches by Vic Valtaggio. Valtaggio this time called the pitch a ball inside to Henderson, and Viola just flipped out. He exploded. Look at Valtaggio. Is he ready for action or what? Again, it's hard for us to tell exactly where the pitch is. It's inside. It appears to hit the corner. Baltazio disagrees. Frankie disagrees with him and challenges him. Baltazio looking straight out at Frank Viola. Well, we know who wins all those arguments. On the other hand, you don't see Frank Viola argue about too much during a baseball game. He's not known for that. Tony Pena had to go out and calm him down. Don Zimmer and Butch Hobson trying to figure things out. Three and one to count to Henderson. Big situation here for both clubs. Open up by a run. Blankenship on ball and Henderson. He's the count go full. Ricky says if I can't get the inside corner, let's see what I can do with a fastball away. This time he gets it a little bit low. Henderson offers at it. Counts full. Blanket chip on first. And one out. Seems that this is going to be a running situation. Henderson definitely swung at ball four there. There's blanket chip. He is going. Henderson pops it up into right center field. Ellis Birch, the center fielder. Camp center for the second out. So Ricky Henderson retired for the first time tonight. Two gone, Blankenship at first for Carney Lansford. Lansford is old for three on the evening. Flew out deep to right in the first. Hit into a fielder's choice in the third, bounced out to second in the fifth. All right, let's manage along with Tony LaRusso. Runner on first base, two outs. You just one run ahead in Boston. When will you hit and run if you do it? Well, Lansford handles the bat very well. Give Lansford one shot at that point to drive the ball into right field. Good number two hitter makes contact. Blanket chip with good speed, not great speed. But if he gets on second, he's in scoring position. And I wonder if Tony LaRusso knows that Lansford is the best hitter for the A's away from home, a 353 average on the road. He's probably got that filed away in his computer mind somewhere. 0 oh, 2 the count to Carney. Another inside pitch, and another player takes exception to it. Lansford 
doesn't believe that that pitch is a strike. Something to the effect that you haven't called it all night. Why are you calling it now? Vic says it's a strike because it was over the plate. Well, Lansford handles the bat well. Thus, the figure of over 300 with two strikes on him. And Viola wanted that pitch as well. He walks in as if to say, where was that? But I don't think he said anything, actually. So <laughs> things are getting testy out there, friends. And inside corner is being hotly contested, not only with a pitch, but with the hitters and the pitchers as well. What's his response? Did I get the inside corner? Pena whips down the first and just getting back his blanket ship. Frankie had a reaction, but he kept it short to the point and didn't challenge Voltaggio. This time he's aware that is the home plate umpire that Frankie's a little hot and he's not going to let him get away with another explosion like that. Two balls, two strikes to Carney Lansford. Hot shot down the box at third, gets the force at second, and that's the inning. So no runs on a hit, no errors, and one left. After six and a half, they're standing for the seventh inning stretch in Boston. A's lead it by one. 4-3 Oakland, bottom of the seventh, Ellis Burks, and a great play by Carney Lansford robs Burks of a base hit. Just as Frank Viola got a key defensive play behind him, on a ground ball in the hole that was fielded by Luis Rivera. His counterpart, Dave Stewart, gets some defensive help with a fine play, a diving play by Carney Lansford. Lansford played a couple of years here at Boston, 1981 and 82 to be exact, and a smattering of applause even though he robbed the hometown Red Sox. As Lansford made that play, the uh, knowledgeable New England fans used to seeing plays like that from Lansford about 10 years ago in this ballpark. They can be tough fans, but boy, they sure appreciate baseball, and they respect the fine play when they see it. Scott Cooper, 0 for 1 with a walk against Dave Stewart. He's ahead of Stu, two balls, no strikes. Ball gets up a little bit. Cooper gets under it. Down the left field line, it will go foul. Ricky Henderson having a chance to continue his game-long chat with the fans in left field. Every time Henderson has left the bench to go out to his position, he's been kibitzing with the people down the left field line. Ricky's such a conversationalist. Lansford in on the grass at third. For Cooper. Outside, three and one to count. Looks like Matt Young warming up in the Boston bullpen. Hasn't been in the game for about eight days. He's probably just getting some work on the side. Stories circulating here in Boston that the management has about had it with Young as Cooper takes a walk to hmm. first base. Of course, Matt Young came over here a couple of years ago in a much publicized move, getting a couple mil for a lifetime record of below 500. And I think people have been outraged at the management here from the beginning for that move, and Young has had more downs than ups here in New England. So Stewart walks Cooper for the second time tonight. Luis Rivera, 0 for 2, steps in. sitting down now in the Boston pen. Well, it's a tough position to be in when you're Matt Young. He knows what the situation is. He knows he hasn't won a game in a year. He's been taken out of the starting rotation. He's not going to really be counted on to go in a ball game unless it's a blowout and the Red Sox are losing. And he knows he has to stay in shape, do everything that he possibly can to get back to form. And it's kind of a catch-22 situation. How do you expect to stay sharp when you don't pitch? And how can you expect to pitch when you're not staying sharp? Meanwhile, the Oakland pen, the lefty is Honeycutt. Jeff Parrott, the right-hander, warming up. Runner on first for the Red Sox. One gone here. Bottom of the seventh, four to three A's. And Rivera has a called strike in the outside corner. Right. 
Tony La Russa taking no chances in case Dave Stewart starts to fade here in the seventh. The figures looking at the lineup Rivera followed by Pena at ninth and then Reed coming up followed by Greenwell and Box. So that's when we'll probably see Honeycutt when we get to Greenwell and Box. Even though Stewart appears to be throwing well, with the exception of two home run balls to Boggs, you would, you would think that La Russa would make a move here in the seventh? It's hard to say. Maybe he sees something down in the dugout that we can't spot up here. He's seen Stewart at his very best, and he's seen him struggle. So if anybody knows him, you have to figure that it's Dave Duncan or La Russa. Scott Cooper, the runner at first. One with a walk, 1-1 one, one to count. For the batter, Luis Rivera. Fly ball center field. Willie Wilson measures it up. And it'll be an easy out. Two gone. That'll bring up Tony Pena. And before Pena steps in, let's go to Gary Miller. Tom, the Angels are playing their first game since that harrowing bus accident. It was a one-all tie between Valera and Ben McDonald when Randy Milligan gets into one, bangs it off the billboards in right field. Cal Ripken scores. Glenn Davis on his way to third. He'd get there. He'd score in a sack fly. Another RBI single, and the O's are breaking it open. It's 4-1 to one in the sixth. They're not going to hold down that Baltimore lineup for long. Oka went in there and trashed them three straight at Camden Yards. Here's Pena looking at ball one. And that stat we spoke about before with Pena comes into play now. From the seventh inning on this year, Tony Pena is hitting 316, so the pressure's on. It'll be his job to keep this inning alive with a base hit so that we can turn, or that the Red Sox can turn the top of this lineup over. On the season right now, Pena is hitting only 204, so that is a dramatic swing between early in the game and late in the game for Pena. Tony's got some power, has only one home run on the season, though. The Red Sox, as a team, have only 16, including two tonight by Boggs. Lazy fly ball. Short right field. Should be all right for Brocious. Wraps it up, and the A's are out of the inning. No runs, a walk. One left. After seven full at Fenway, four to three, Oakland. Manager, first time out, go with it. This team always seems to perform well. The Expos are doing that tonight. You can't fire all of the players. All, you, all that a management can do is hope to shake guys up with maybe different leadership. Jose Canseco leads it off here in the top of the eighth inning for the Oakland A's. Canseco, McGuire, and Steinbach. And there's Mark, who obviously has been watching the scoreboard tonight and knows that Rob Deere has two home runs in Detroit and that his lead has now dwindled to four in the home run column. 17 to 13. <laughs> Canseco looked sick on that swing, didn't he? He waited, waited, and waited some more, and he was still out in front. Now, we can't see it as Canseco would, but we can see it from this point of view. Notice he's on his front foot. He bends that front knee, trying to buy a little bit more time, but the ball never gets to the plate. And he completes his swing without making contact. One and two. As a pitcher, Jerry, can you tell, once you, you faced hitters a few times, can you tell by their swing if they're all screwed up at the plate. Sometimes you can tell by their swing. Sometimes you can tell by their reaction. And Senko pops it up and it'll be out of play. Pena gives it a run anyway. So the count remains one and two to Jose Canseco, who has eight home runs on the season. But since 87, Guess who has hit the most home runs in Major League Baseball? Canseco's teammate. And Mr. Strawberry, who's now on the disabled list for Tommy Lasorda. Home run hitters drive Cadillacs, except for Jose, who drives a Porsche. He drives it hard. Yeah, <laughs> drives it hard and fast. Well, life is short, drive hard, right? You know what the slogan says, something like that. Here's the one two. Canseco turns on it just foul. He hit that one a ton. Canseco's made some good contact tonight. He singled his last time up in the fifth and it was a hard single. 
see him motioning with those fluorescent gloves. Trying to stay loose with his knee before he came up with, to this at bat. He has a little bit of trouble with his shoulder. This time he tends to drag that bat through the strike zone. Doesn't have the same kind of power, but still. He's, he's, so what? he's not superhuman. He's merely human. Still gets around in a Frankie B pitch. So I love the way Pena and Benito Santiago sit back there and catch. On both knees, Pena spread out there. Two balls and two strikes. Watch the way he went. Now he's at one knee. That last pitch he was on two. Canseco, long shot. It is gone. Home run number nine for Jose Canseco. Viola upset with himself because he didn't get the ball where he wanted on Canseco. Felt that he had a chance to get him out earlier in the count. And of course goes full. Canseco gets a chance to see what happens. And then he drives it into the screen in left field. He's got a target right down the middle. Canseco gets the ball about belt high. And Viola knows that when it's hit, it's gone. You saw that same look on the face of Dave Stewart when he gave one up to Wade Boggs. And now there's a conference on the mound after that home run by Canseco. That was smoke. There was no watching the fielder on that one. You just wanted to see if it would get over the net. It did not. But I would venture to say it ruptured the net pretty good when it got there. And that'll be all for Frank Viola. Greg Harris gets set to come in for the Boston Red Sox. We'll detail the pitching change in a moment. Top of the eighth inning. Oakland leads it by two. Harris making his 17th appearance of the year and he comes in to face Mark McGuire with the bases empty and one run already in here at the top of the eight five three Oakland one ball and one strike Harris uh, ERA of 1.15 two and three in the win loss column 1.55 ERA I should say you see McGuire's average dipping just below 300. Mark 0 for 3 on the night. I was thinking about it, uh, Jerry. Maybe Viola and the Red Sox caught a break. If Frank was going to break down to Kensenko, lucky that nobody was on base ahead of him, and it's still just a two run uh, lead. Jody Reed gets this one behind second. McGuire jogs down to first, and he's an easy out, one gone. Some of the greatest pitchers gave up a lot of home runs. Warren Spahn was one, Robin Roberts was another. Bert Blylevin, a contemporary, he's given up a lot of home runs, but he's on his way to winning 300 games. And you see the same thing with Viola and Stewart tonight. They've given up three home runs between them, but each home run has been without anybody on. It's one of those things that's going to happen when you throw strikes and you're around the plate. Well, Viola a little bit happier now, even though he's trailing, than he was a couple of innings ago. I <laughs> think with Vic Voltaggio. Realizing his evening is over, there's not much he can do about it, except to Greg Harris to keep Boston close. Red Sox have the top of the order due up in the bottom of the eighth. Steinbach lofting one into right center field coming over his field plan here and he makes the catch two gone. Great. Harris has been around 36 years of age. This is his third season with Boston third full season he's been in the Phillies organization had a cup of coffee with Cincinnati Montreal San Diego he's been around. And coming up next, it'll be Bobby Bonilla and the New York Mets continuing their West Coast swing against Bill Swift and the San Francisco Giants. The Giants on a roll, a two-game lead in the NL West coming into play tonight. That's coming up right after a game tonight from Fenway. Tom Mees and Jerry Royce from Fenway Park, 5-3 Oakland. Top of the eighth inning, two gone. And Willie Wilson the back. Wilson seen talking to himself in the dugout after his second strikeout back in the sixth inning. Had some thoughts to share with the wall and and the runway down on the way back to the clubhouse. Got it out of the system, went to the outfield. You have to vent those frustrations somehow, and you don't want to do it publicly. It embarrasses you, and it's not really professional. The Angels, I know this for a fact, have a punching bag right in the runway so that when you have something that you have to get out you go and take it out in a punching bag sure You're saves kidding. yeah sure saves beating a, a, a water cooler with a bat oh. Wilson ground ball hit hard to second baseman Reed and the Red Sox are out of the inning but the damage is done a solo shot by Jose Canseco one run and one hit 
We go to the bottom of the eighth. Oakland on top of the Red Sox, five to three. The Red Scott Ruskin on a relief of Tim Belcher has been no relief. Darren Dalton, where is it? Biff Roberts, is it over the wall? It's over his head. That falls in for a double. He had knocked in two runs earlier with a single, and the Phils have now up eight to two through eight. Back to Fenway. All right, Gary, you know, Darren Dalton, one of the best young catchers in the game, is on fire in the month of May at the plate. Had a rough April. Phillies can score runs. Their problem been keeping the other teams off the board. Top, rather, bottom of the eighth inning. Jody Reed, first pitch to shortstop deep in the hole. Can he beat it? He's out. Oh, what a play by Mike Bordick at shortstop, getting Reed by a half a step. When you're a pitcher on the mound, it's a close ball game, and somebody hits a ground ball that appears to be going through, and a guy makes a great play. You're cheering for him as he makes this play across the diamond. But nobody's happier than Bordick. Look at him. He gets to the ball. Reed doesn't have great speed. And from both knees, makes a perfect throw over to first base. It's down, and you get a scoop by McGuire. He didn't win, he didn't win the gold glove, but that's a gold glove kind of play. Mm. And you know what I like about Mark Johnson, the first base umpire there? He waited that split second to be sure in his own mind before he gave the indication. And sometimes uh, that isn't the case, but he did his job perfectly as well. He got down on one knee. He saw and heard everything. And I think he made the proper call. Then he took a look to see if McGuire held on to the ball. Excellent defensive play by Mike Bordy. Meanwhile, Mike Greenwell already in a hole 0 and 2 to Stewart. That's got to give Dave Stewart a big lift. He's got to be out there saying, hey, I know I'm in the eighth inning. I could come out at any time, but darn it, I'm going to try and finish this thing now. Guys making plays like that behind you. Line shot to center field, base hit for Greenwell. And the hero of the night for Boston at the plate is coming up, Wade Boggs. Now Boggs in the first inning stepped in. And this is what he did to Stewart. Home run. Next time up, home run. Or double. Next time up, home run. They all look the same from that angle, <laughs> except for the expression on Dave Stewart's face. He sees that one go out and he says, two home runs tonight. Wade Boggs got them both. Tony La Russa out to the mound. They're going to make a move. Dave Stewart comes out. And in comes left-hander Rick Honeycutt. As Honeycutt trots to the mound, we'll take a timeout. We're in the bottom of the eighth. Oakland leading by two. The Red Sox threatening back to Fenway in a moment. Pitching change here at Fenway Park here in the bottom of the eighth inning. Rick Honeycutt out of the Oakland A's bullpen. Dave Stewart is through for the night. That's single by Mike Greenwell. And Jody Reed, the batter before, actually hit one hard to the hole in shortstop. So Stewart, I guess La Russa thought, tiring a bit, not taking any chances. The lefty Rick Honeycutt comes in to face the left-handed Wade Boggs. But Boggs is on. When he's on, does it make any difference? It doesn't matter much. Uh, when Boggs hits that ball in the outside part of the plate, he hits it so well here at Fenway Park. Uh, and that's why he's been so successful. You have 2,000 career hits, you can hit pretty much anybody. And he has shown that he's not affected, at least by matchups and Honeycutt, because lifetime four for seven off of Honeycutt. Honeycutt on the year with 11 innings pitched. He has eight strikeouts, two walks, and this is the kind of situation that Tony LaRusso likes to use him in. Come in to get a key left-handed hitter out. Well, you see, hitting right, he's only 218 this season. Going against the old percentages, against lefties, hitting a lusty 357. So Wade Boggs, two home runs sandwiched around a double. Three runs scored. Two runs batted in. 5-3, Boston trailing. Here in the eighth, one out, Greenwell on first. A key moment in this game. And Honeycutt bluffing, stepping off the rubber. McGuire not even holding the runner. Greenwell on. Honeycutt with a good move toward first base, but Greenwell doesn't have great speed and doesn't figure to run in this situation. Rick Honeycutt with a newly cropped mustache. Not used to seeing that. Boggs looks to the third base coaching box, and Don Zimmer, once upon a time, managed this Boston club. 
And very well, I might add, for a few years. Box ahead to count one and all. Called strike. Honeycutt, his last five appearances, has gone three and a third innings. He's allowed just one hit and struck out four. Features a fastball that sinks and a slider. Typical sinker slider kind of pitcher, but he's very effective against left handed hitters. The 1 1. Just outside ball two. When the uh, Red Sox were on the West Coast, Boston hitters two for 12 against uh, Honeycutt earlier this season. So hitting him just for a 167 average so far this year. Here's the 2 1. Line drive to center field. Willie Wilson goes back, retreats, makes the catch. Two gone. And Greenwell has to trot back to first. Once again, Wade Boggs hits the ball very well, this time to another part of the ballpark, the expansive part of Fenway Park. And this time, he re they finally retire him. But he cut with a slider over the middle of the plate. Boggs a little bit out in front. Still hits a line drive. Only Willie Wilson is back there to pull it in. So Honeycutt gets the job done and he will leave and Tony La Russa says it's time for the Eck. Dennis Eckersley will make his move out of the Boston bullpen. Honeycutt goes one third of an inning and gets the job done. So there are two outs here in the bottom of the eighth inning. It is still 5-3 Oakland. ESPN Major League Baseball is brought to you by Anheuser-Busch, who proudly brings you family talk. Let's stop underage drinking before it starts. Bottom of the eighth inning, Fenway Park, and I'm Tom Meese with Jerry Royce. A's lead the Red Sox 5-3. Uh, Jerry, there are only three sure things in life, death, taxes, and if the A's have a one or two run lead in the eighth or ninth, you'll see this man, Dennis Eckersley. And what a man to have to see. Look at those strikeouts, 27 strikeouts, only one walk in 20 innings. It's phenomenal. It's beyond anything that I can comprehend because I've never seen anybody with this kind of pinpoint control and have this kind of success. And Dennis, without trying to demean him at all is no spring chicken he's been around this game a long time he spent six and a half years here in Boston as a starting pitcher and I've never seen anybody make the transition from starter to reliever and dominate the game the way this guy has the act Dennis Eckersley last four years he has racked up 169 saves all he wants now is one out Jack Clark the batter and he'll look at a called strike That's that's incredible. If I didn't see that, I know our producer Woody Freeman wouldn't put it up if it's true. But if I didn't see it, I wouldn't believe it. Because the thing to me is that it's gone beyond believable. Let's just go back a year or two with Eckersley. He had in 1988 70 strikeouts and 11 walks. In '89, 55 strikeouts and only three walks. 73 and four in 1990. It it's just phenomenal Clark swings very hard and fouls it back almost got a freebie here in the booth no balls and two strikes Clark is over three on the night and his average is dipping 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 lower and now at 189 and falling only 18 hits on the year for Jack Clark who's a streak hitter and he makes no bones about it He's in a bad streak here eight appearances this month for Eckersley eight saves 16 appearances on the year 16 saves he doesn't miss does he called strike three he had Clark tied up in knots and the Eck racks up another notch on the gun belt we go to the night Oakland on top five to three with you on Friday Night Baseball right after our game it'll be the Giants and the Mets from Candlestick where Dennis Eckersley gets the A's out of another pickle Striking out Jack Clark to end the eighth inning. We go to the top of the ninth. Greg Harris remains in for the Red Sox. Scott Brocious, Mike Fordick, and Lance Blankenship, the first three uh, right against him here in the inning. Most people would look at that and say, well, it's the bottom of the order. I've got to get through these guys so that I don't have to face the top of the order. But that's easier said than done because 
It was a single by Bordick, a double by Blankenship, and then eventually a two-run single by Henderson that started the uprising in the Oakland A's fifth. Brocious first pitch swinging, lofting one to center. Who's going to catch it? Burks is there, but Greenwell cuts in front of him for the out. Ellis telling Mike, look, that's my ball. <laughs> Get out of here. One gone. Mike Bordick, who made a fine play on it. Ball deep in the hole by Jody Reed in the last half inning. One for three on the night for Bordick. Second leading hitter in the American League. And when he made that defensive play, there was a smattering of applause here because he has about 35 or 40 of his closest friends in the ballpark down from the state of Maine. And he considers Fenway Park hollowed grounds mm. as a child. He would listen to the broadcast on the radio and grew up coming to these ball games and cheering for these Red Sox. He said it was a feeling that was indescribable. He, something he couldn't put into words the first time that he walked on this field as a player. Takes a ball outside from Harris, one and two. Of course, now he's a major league ball player. He's got family close by. And what happens? You have to make room for these people. Make sure you get tickets. And that's no easy task here at Fenway Park. Swing and a miss. He'll go back to the dugout disappointed, but Mike's played a fine game tonight in the field and at the plate. No stranger to a strikeout, Greg Harris. 29 innings. Or 30 innings, he has 28 of them. Good curveball. That's what is known as the bottom falling out of that curveball. Two gone for Lance Blankenship. Lance two for two with a walk tonight. Scored a run on a double in the fifth inning. And Bennett's actively pondering how he maybe can strike out the side on nine pitches in the ninth inning. I wouldn't be surprised to see him do that. One and one. You know, you look at Eckersley, you and I were talking during the break. He's almost too good. I mean, he's not good. There are different ways to measure how good he really is. We were talking about the fact of the strikeouts and the walks, but the thing that really shows me how good he is is when I thought of, about it, who would I rather have in a game than Eckersley? Jeff Reardon, who's just in the bullpen across the way from where Eckersley was, would you choose Reardon over Eckersley? I think not. No. Lazy fly ball back to second base. Reed is under it. Blankenship is out. So the A's and the Red Sox are down to the last three out. We'll find out what to do with them in a moment. Five to three. Open on top. The X comes out for the ninth inning. The Red Sox, everyone, on Friday Night Baseball, Plantier, Burks, and Cooper schedule up against Dennis Eckersley. But the way this man's been blowing them down this year, it hardly matters who is scheduled up. We don't mean to go on and on, but you have to go on and on about a guy who's got 45 saves in 88, 33 in 89, 48 in 90, 43 in 91. And not, you talk, most pitchers, Jerry, you talk about walk-strikeout ratio. With him, it's strike the ball ratio. We, they've taken it one step further. But just expanding on what we talked about earlier, it, this is not a slam for Jeff Reardon or Rob Dibble or Lee Smith. But when you put all of these guys together, you have to choose just one. My choice is Eckersley. Mm. Bill Plantier, one for three on the night with a double. The double came off Dave Stewart. Let's see what he does against Eckersley. Come as no surprise. The first pitch is a called strike. Lansford way in on the grass at third base against Lantier. Inside corner. I tell you, success is its own reward. Eckersley, because the umpires know of his reputation for being around the plate, I'm not saying that wasn't a strike. It was. But any close call, he tends to get too. The hitters ought to know that. Surprised to see more guys out there not or first pitch swinging he's still coming with two off speed pitches to plant here he throws a fastball he throws a slider and he's been working on a changeup now he's taking something off his pitches Eckersley fantastic record but let's give Larusa credit too he knows how to use him hardly ever brings him in before the eighth inning and when he does bring him in it's usually against a right-handed batter now tonight he brought him in 
against the right-handed batter as well. You had Honeycutt come in to pitch to the left-handed batter, Boggs. And then the right-handed batter, Clark. And who would you rather have a matchup with? Uh, uh, Honeycutt against Clark or Eckersley against him? No contact. Two balls, two strikes. The count to Plantier. Bill just wants to get on base. Two runs down. But I, even though the count is even at two, I would hope he's not thinking about working a walk here. It usually ain't going to happen with Eckersley. Fly ball into the left field. Ricky Henderson comes over. One gone here in the ninth. Ellis Burks is the next batter to try his luck against Eckersley. As we update this continuous stat now, has faced 75 batters in the year and thrown only 77 balls. Well, as Burks hasn't exactly had a day at the beach against Eckersley, has he? Ball one. One for 15 lifetime, including four strikeouts. Translates into 0 0.067 in the old batting average. There's the off-speed pitch again by Eckersley. Using a changeup tonight. I haven't seen him use a changeup. The pitch has a little bit of wrinkle toward the end. Throws a slider that has a little bit more break downward. This is what Eckersley needs, another pitch. Burks a line drive, single to right field. So Ellis Burks gets his bat on the ball, goes against form against Eckersley. Well, they're, 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 well, there are two really ways, ways to look at that. One is that he's one for 15, he makes a lot of outs. And the other thing you could say is that maybe he's due to get a hit. Cooper. Well, Ellis Burks has been swinging a hot bat Bruce coming Lee. into this game. Cooper. Had upped his average considerably. It had been down around 200. He came in hitting at 242, and now is one for four on the night. So Scott Cooper, who has walked twice, so officially he is 0 for 1, grounded out to second. Back in the fourth inning, he'll try and keep it going. Ball one to him. Luis Rivera is due up behind Cooper, but I don't think we'll see that. We'll have to wait and see. Outside, ball two. Now Rivera is in, he is in the on-deck circle. Two and all the count to Scott Cooper. A lot of the crowd here, so convinced that Eckersley was going to do the job without trouble, started to leave. Cooper lost one into short center field. Ricky Henderson cuts over two gone. Rivera will walk back. He will not bat. That was just for show in the on deck circle. I believe it's Tom Brodansky. Get the pine tar in the lumber. Brodansky warms up. Well, he warms up. We'll tell you that right after our game here at Fenway, we're going to go to Candlestick Park. Steve Fisiak and company standing by to bring you the Mets and the Giants. Steve Fisiak and Dave Campbell. The New York Mets coming off a four-game split in San Diego. They come into play tonight, only a game and a half behind the Pirates in the National League East. The Giants, leaders in the West, having won three in a row. They just swept the Pirates. They lead San Diego by two coming in. Last bit of hope, Tom Brunanski. Swings at the first pitch, bouncer to shortstop Bordick, the force, and the A's wrap it up. Five runs, nine hits, no errors for Oakland. Three runs, six hits, no errors for Boston. The Eck does it again, Jerry. Well, the Eck does it again, but he got some great defense behind him. Well, actually, Dave Stewart did because Stewart get the, got the win. Some great plays by Bordick, plus he got on base and set the table for the big guys. So two home runs for Wade Boggs tonight, wasted. They were both solo shots. Jose Canseco had his ninth of the year for Oakland. Dave Stewart, Eckersley, and Honeycutt combined on a six-hitter. Oakland wins it 5-3. to three. For Jerry Royce, I'm Tom Mees. Let's go to San Francisco.